I've compiled some of the coolest and most popular woodworking tools you've ever seen in one compilation video. You don't want to miss a single one. Let's go. Number one on the list is the DFM Small Square. This thing is very small, but it packs a ton of features into a tiny little package. Let me show you. And if you're not a fan of purple like I am, then you can actually get this in blue, black, gray, or even tie-dye colors. So multiple colors to choose from. I'll put a link in the description below to all the tools you see in the video today. One of the main uses for such a small square is using it to square up the blade on your table saw. And the reason a small square works in this situation is it's under the teeth of the blade. So you raise your blade up and then you can put this on there and then move it to square and the teeth don't affect it. On a lot of times on say a speed square or any other type of right angle square that is taller than say two or three inches, the teeth start affecting it because you have to make sure that the blade of the square isn't touching one of the teeth on your saw blade. Because if it does, it'll throw it off. If you squared your table saw blade up with a longer square before, you know what I'm talking about. Also, if you have a small bench top bandsaw like I have, it's really great for that because there's not many squares that can fit in this tiny little space to check the square of the blade to the table. This is perfect for that. You can also use this at the drill press to check the square of your drill bits to the table all the way around. Another really cool feature of this little square is it comes with these little metal pins that drop in these holes. And it's gonna help you find the center of any board up to this wide. Drop those pins in, then twist it, and then wherever it lands right there is gonna be centered. There's a hole in the middle uh, that's four pencils. It has a small hole down in the bottom for pencil lead to go through. You just twist that and then you just mark the board. That's gonna be your center mark. It also works on thinner stock as well. And that's gonna be center every time. Of course, a square is a square for a reason and you can use it to check the square of your cuts. If you're using smaller pieces like this, or like this. You can also use it to check the face to the edge of a square of thin stock like this. And of course you can use it on chisels to check, uh oh, that one's out of square. You, gotta, you can check the blade of your chisel to see if they're square, which mine are not. You'll find a ton of uses for this tiny little square in your shop. It's just, it's durable. It's made out of solid aluminum. So even if you chunk it like I just did, it's not gonna hurt it. And you can stick it in your pocket and keep it with you at all times, just in case you're at Walmart and need to know if the shelf is square. Number two on the list, this is the Fulton Thin Rip Jig. You can use this on your table saw, your router table, or your bandsaw. Let me show you. If you've ever had to make several thin strips on your table saw, this thing is gonna be your next best friend. If you see on the router table or the workbench where I've ripped those half or three quarter inch wide walnut strips to cover the edge of that plywood to make it look a little better or various other reasons you need to rip thin strips, this thing will make everything much easier. Let me show you. So it runs in a miter slot, fits most table saw miter slots. Put it behind the blade, never put it at or on the other side of the blade because that could cause kickback. So the way this works is it has a knob on top. You loosen that off and you set the fence where you want it for the first cut. Move this over until it touches your work or the wood you're cutting and then tighten this knob down. Once you snug this knob down, it's gonna snug up in the T-track or in your miter slot as well. That way it doesn't move. And then there's a roller right here on the end that rolls, helps guide the wood through the cut. And I'm gonna make several cuts to show you how it works. But once you make the first cut, then you can move your fence over with the stock between the fence and the jig. And then when it bumps, lock your fence down to make your next cut. It's gonna be the same every single time. So as you can see, I was able to make seven strips that are quarter inch wide, exactly the same, just by moving the fence. If you've ever tried to make that quarter inch rip by setting the fence at a quarter inch and then ripping with the quarter inch between the blade and the fence, you know at the end of that cut, it gets kind of hairy because there's only a quarter inch space so you can't get a push stick in there to finish the cut. And it makes it just, it's just too dangerous. This makes it a lot safer. And it's a really cool little jig that you can use in multiple places. This is one of those tools you'll be glad you got it when you need it. And they're so inexpensive, 
it's well worth having it in the shop. It's extremely well made, all aluminum except for this top handle, which is plastic. But other than that, everything is metal. So you're really, it's gonna last you a very long time. I like that it has a scale on there and I like how easy it fits or works on the table saw. I said it'll work on a router table or bandsaw. That's if you have a proper miter slot in there and not T-Track, just keep that in mind. Speaking of things under $30, go check out 731woodworks.com slash store. We have a lot of build plans available for you under $30 and several bundle packages will save you even more money bundling them together versus buying them individually. Easy to follow, step-by-step -step build plans to help you make awesome projects. Go check us out. Number three on the list, a DFM setup block. Now, I bought all of these tools. DFM doesn't even know my name. I just saw these on Amazon and thought they were fantastic. So I'll pick both the square and this up. Check this out. So we got our blade square earlier, remember with the little setup square. Now we can use the setup block to actually get the height set correctly. What I love about this little block is it's really simple to use. It stands on its own and it has clearly marked measurements. This is one eight, three eighths, five eighths. The other side's quarter, half, three quarter, all the way up to two inches. You can use this to set the height of your blade. And the blade itself is precisely a quarter inch thick. So you could also use it that way to set up one quarter inch deep. Quarter, quarter. And of course you can also use it here at the router table to set the depth of your bits as needed all the way from again eighth to two inches you can also use it on a fixed base router to set the depth but it does take a little extra oomph because it'll fall off the edge and not hold square it's not really the best for this but it will work in a pinch dfm tools are made in the usa if you like to support usa owned and operating companies so go check them out i'll put a link to this in the description number four on the list Spring clamps. This is a six inch spring clamp from Tay Tools. You can get the, a 10 pack of these for less than $15 at the time of this recording. So you can get a ton of these for a low, low price. They actually come in several different sizes, two, three, four, six, and nine, I believe. These are the six inch models. What's really great about these is they actually have a really strong spring, get a good clamping pressure, and then also pivoting non-marring jaws on the tips and then in the jaw of them there's little teeth so if you had to clamp around something round like a dial this would work for that as well most of us work alone in the shop and having an extra set of hands is always needed in a lot of situations anyway so for instance if i was trying to hang these drawer slides a lot of times i like to make my mark where they're going to go and then trying to get those in place without some type of jig or help is can be difficult these little clamps will help you get those in place and then you can set your drawer slide in place and then attach it to the frame that you're going to be putting the drawers in. So that's going to give you a little support, an extra hand in that situation. Also on small glue ups where you don't want to break out the big clamps or you just don't need them, you can just use these to hold your pieces in place while they dry. These are super handy for that because you can put multiples on there. They have plenty of clamping pressure for small parts like that. If I was gluing those two pieces up and needed just to hold those while the glue dried, Perfect, perfect for that. You can also use them like a face clamp, similar to a pocket hole when you're pocket holding pieces together. Uh, because these two pieces pivot, you'll be able to pivot. You'll be able to put those pieces together. It'll hold them flush while you drive your pocket holes. And I'm telling you, there's just so many uses for these things. I could just, we could just keep going. I keep mine here on the end of the workbench so that they're always handy within arm's reach. But you can also clamp them on the shelf. As you see here, just anywhere that this thing will clamp to. A 10 pack of these for under $15, like that's a no brainer in my opinion, just to have these in the shop when you need them. They're very well made. This is a good quality plastic. It doesn't feel cheap at all. And the spring, I don't know how to explain how much pressure is there. Like I couldn't hold this for an extended length of time just sitting here like this. My hand would get really tired because that's a, it's a really strong spring. Even putting your finger in it is uncomfortable. It doesn't like crush you, but it's uncomfortable. This is a really good set of hand clamps or spring clamps that you need to pick up in your shop. Last but certainly not least, clamping assembly squares. If you have ever tried to put two pieces of plywood together making a cabinet, like on the router table or even this workbench, or building cabinets, miter stations, anything like that, and you need those two pieces to stay 90 degrees while you're working on them, and it won't fall over on you constantly like you see here, 
or you're trying to pocket all things together and you just need them to hold at 90 degrees, free up your hands because you're by yourself. As we stated before, you just need an extra set of hands. This is what you need. And of course they come in a variety of sizes. The eight inch, the biggest ones are under $15, under $20 at the time of this filming. And that's the most expensive set. You're gonna get four in the set. Of course you can pick up the six inch, the four inch or the three inch as well. Of course, as they get smaller, the price goes down on the sets. So how do they work? Well, they're actually really simple. They're a perfect 90 degree angle. Doesn't matter which size you get. If we were joining these two pieces together, then you would need to hold that somehow. If you listen to me and you picked up these, of course, this is the easiest, fastest way. You're gonna clamp that in place. It's gonna be there. Or you can use F-style clamps like these. But as you can see, that took a little bit longer because I'm having to rinse that down on by myself and all that, but it works. So you can use F's clamps, you can use these clamps. Now this is at a perfect 90 degree. I've got pocket holes drilled on the back and I can attach these two pieces if I need to, when I need to. And if I wanna go take a lunch break, this is gonna be there and it's not gonna move on me. While I'm not on the list, these little F clamps are also under $30 and they're really handy to have for applications just like this. If you wanna pick some of those up, I'll drop a link to these even though just kind of bonus. These are great if you're just trying to lay your piece out and make sure everything's gonna fit right, kind of dry fit or mark for mortise and tenon, mark for dials, mark for dominoes, anything like that where you just need everything to kind of stay in place. These little clamping squares are awesome. Also, you can use them on either side and just clamp them in place like that. As inexpensive as these are and solidly made, it says glass reinforced nylon. I'm not sure what that means other than probably the material it's made out of. They're not, they're not gonna break. They're really solid. They're perfect 90s. I also like the fact that on the back, there's a, like a little 45 chamfer there so you can get it all the way in that corner without anything getting in the way. And then of course it has a little scale here on the side, 45 and all of them are perfect 90 to each other. So if you wanna mix and match them, you could do that as well. These are one of those tools you know when you see it, you're like, I gotta add me some of those, so go get them. So these are the Craig setup blocks. These things are phenomenal. I didn't know how useful the stuff like this would be in a woodworking shop until I got these a few weeks ago. They come in this pack and they go from 1 8 inch all the way to half inch. And I gotta give it to Craig customer service because when I got my package, I actually had two 7 16 inch bars in there and did not have a half inch. I reached out to them and they overnighted me the half inch bar. So that was really good customer service. What's extremely useful about this tool is their multi-function. They have a depth gauge. They can, you can check the depth of your cut with that. And then they have a fence gauge. Let me show you how to use them. One of the main uses and one of the main reasons I bought these Craig setup blocks was to set the depth of my router bits. Before I was trying to use a tape measure to do it. And you know, if you're doing that, it, you just can't seem to get it accurate. You gotta hold the tape measure and you're trying to fumble with this router to get everything up, moved up and down. What I really like about these, they'll set right there you can raise your router until you get to the depth you want, anywhere from 1 8 inch all the way to half inch with this these setup block. I've got it set at a half inch deep. So we've got a half inch and we can test that cut and it is exactly one half inch. Another awesome use of these is they actually have a fence gauge right there on the end. That's what that elongated piece is. That allows you to set your fence depth whether that be on a band saw, a table saw, or a router table. Now we'll be able to have a half inch cut there and that gives you a perfect setup every single time and you don't have to rely on your fence gauge. You can also set this to set the depth of your cut on your table saw. Just like that, we'll get a half inch cut here and then you can set it to the half inch. So if you was making some type of quarter, quarter, quarter drawer or something like that, this would allow you to set up perfect half inch away from everything. So these are actually made out of aluminum. They're machined, so they're extremely accurate. They're extremely durable. You can't bend them unless, you, I guess you could if you really tried, but just normal everyday use, you're not gonna bend it. Uh, they're extremely accurate. They also have holes drilled in them if you wanted to hang them on the wall or something. I like to keep them in this case that they come in because everything stays nice and organized. So Mike Taylor from taytools.com sent me this on a project we're collaborating on. This was in the box and I put it on the shelf. When I pulled it out of the box, I was like, I don't even know what this is. It was a mystery to me. So I put it on the shelf and I've looked at it and looked at it. I never could figure it out and I was embarrassed to ask. 
So I sent him a message that said, hey man, what does this thing do? If you know what this is, pause the video right now and comment below what it is, if you know. All right, now that you're back. <laughs> it's genius, absolutely genius. It is a carpenter square fence. It goes on, it's got some brass screws that you just tighten down with the flathead, just snug them up. As long as everything's touching, this thing is gonna be accurate, dead accurate. It's awesome, let me show you how it works. Man, this thing is so fantastic. I didn't even know that I needed this, but now I know. You can just use that as an edge guide or a square guide for your carpenter square. It'll fit any carpenter square that I know of. It's a perfect 90 and it it's just, carpenter square should come with one of these. They're so handy. I actually used it on a mobile workbench build that I'm working on. It should be out this next week. Hold that in place and use that as an edge guide for your router, a circular saw, a jigsaw, any reason you need an edge guide up to 24 inches on a carpenter square. It's so inexpensive, but so handy to have. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed if you got one of those. Basically, you, you turn this into a giant speed square is what you've done. The number two tool on your list that you need, that you didn't know you needed, was these Woodpecker's Edge Rule. These were actually sent to me as a gift by a viewer, thank you very much. These are extremely useful tools. I use them all the time now. I did not even realize how useful they were gonna be when I got them. I keep the 36 inch one by the miter saw because that's where I would use it the most. But the smaller one, like this 12 inch, and then there's a 24 and then a six. The 24 and the 36 are my most used, but I do like to have these smaller ones. I keep them in the drawer. These are at a 90 degree, one size three eighths inch wide, one side is three quarters inch wide. And what that does is it allows you to hook it onto the corner or the edge of a board. Doesn't matter if you're using two befores or one bys or whatever, four quarter, eight quarter, doesn't matter. It'll hook onto that and it'll just set there freehand. What makes these awesome is you can line this up. You can flush it up on one end like that. The measurements are laid out sloped towards your materials. If we were marking for five inches, we can just, hold it right there and we got a good accurate mark. We know we got it. The problem with using a tape measure for something like this is uh, we all know that they're curved and sometimes it's just hard to get an accurate mark. Holding the tape measure, it's trying to reel up on you. It's just awkward sometimes. One of the other features I really like about these is they're exactly the same. So they're dead on every time, they're dead accurate. When you're using multiple things to measure with, you're gonna run into problems. I've made a video on tape measures a while back, but no two tape measures seem to be the same. Just starting out here with these, you got the one inch mark is off on all three of these. So if I'm using three different tape measures for a project, I'm gonna get screwed pretty quick when you start trying to square things up. Even at two feet, we can see how far off they are. It's, it's a 16th off between those two. And these are about a 32nd off. And these are two co-melon tapes and then a fast cap tape. So you can see pretty quick you can get off when you're trying to do precise work. And in woodworking, when you're building furniture and other items, you want to be accurate. It, that's gonna matter whether it's set square, whether it's setting flat on the floor and not wobbling, you need accurate tools. Another great feature about these edge rules is because this is 3 eighths of an inch on this side, you can actually find center of a 3 quarter inch board really quickly. If you're trying to find center on a two before, this is three quarters inch wide. So this is easy to do. You just hold it square on the board, mark up against that edge. You're gonna flip it around. And you're gonna use that other edge to do the same thing. We got center of that board every time. These are also made out of aluminum. So they're extremely strong. You don't have to worry about messing them up. They also come with these stop blocks. The blocks are plastic. And I think for the money that you're spending on these, these should be aluminum as well. They kind of cheaped out on these stop blocks. I, I don't like that part, but the edge rule itself is an excellent product. These are useful to have, so you can make repeated measurements every time. If you're only gonna pick up one of these, I recommend the 24 inch. That's the one I use the most often in the shop. If you do get the 12 inch and you wear an apron, a woodworking apron, this thing will fit right in there. Easy peasy, lemon squeezies. Hey, click that subscribe button below, click the bell icon next to it, click all so you get notified of all of our new content that we've got coming. This is called a dead man switch or an electric foot switch. The way it works is you plug your tool into the foot switch, then you plug your foot switch into the wall. You just step on it. 
your tool comes on because it gets power. It's just a disconnect switch that you actually just step on. This foot switch is mainly a convenience. Router tables, drill presses, lays, scroll saws, or even a band saw if you've got a smaller 110 volt band saw. It's just convenient. You walk up, you step on the gas, you got power. I mean, that's just basically all it is is a convenience. Is it kind of a safety feature? It can be if, so I've got this drill press, if I had a bit in there and I'm drilling something, I've got a hand on the crank here, I've got a hand on the workpiece. If something goes wrong at any point, if something gets hung or whatever, and I'm, I'm drilling, all I gotta do is just take my foot off the gas, the power stops, and then I can deal with whatever issue I've got. So a lot of people have scroll saws. This is great for that because you can do your work, take your foot off the power, and then reposition, do your work, things like that. 20 bucks or less for this convenience is just, it's kind of a no-brainer. Number five on the list is probably one of my favorite jigs or tools that I've gotten recently. And I bought this, actually I bought it and then they reimbursed me for the money to use on this channel. So full disclosure there. However, I already bought it, so I was already committed. I didn't know they were gonna refund the money. This thing is phenomenal. This is one of the, I say phenomenal a lot. This thing is really a genius design. It's so easy to use. This is a dowel max. This is how you do dowel joinery right. So I actually bought this at one time, a dowel kit jig. It's plastic, it's cheap, it's extremely hard to use. Nothing lines up right for me. I never had any luck with it. This thing, dead accurate, every single time, no issues. You can use 3 8 inch dowels. You can also use quarter inch dowels if you buy the quarter inch setup. Dowelmax actually has a ton of instructional videos on how to use this. They also compare this to the Festool Domino. This is extremely much less expensive than a Domino, and it's more strong than a domino joint according to their research. Let me show you how to use it. It's so simple. So you can join any number of thicknesses of material. Of course, if you get much smaller than the three quarters of an inch thick, you're gonna wanna go with the quarter inch dowels. But three quarter and up, I just use these three eighths inch dowels, which is what this dowel pin jig is set up for. You can drill up to five in a row, and then this thing will automatically adjust to the size you need. So if I was just wanting to do a butt joint there, I could dial that in. It's gonna be perfectly flush top and side. If you want to do an inset, I actually done a 3 8 inch inset on my workbench here. This is where I first used the dial max. It worked extremely well. Everything come out flawless. So it's extremely easy to use. All you're gonna do is set this on there. Make sure everything's tightened up. Up here, these four screw, thumb screws, you'll tighten these two up and that's gonna make it snug against the workpiece. The check mark, is your top side, there's a check mark right there. You know, make sure that's flush. This boot side is the face of your work so that you know that each piece, whatever face you're gonna be using, then put the boot to the face as we always kind of remember it. Perfectly centered every time. Now we want this piece to go on there in the face, so we gotta make sure we put the boot to the face. Once they're snugged up, all you gotta do is drill your two holes. That's a perfect joint. It's perfectly flush here. It's perfectly lined here, flush. I mean, it's just, it's as easy as a pocket hole. So the Dowmax actually comes with several spacer plates so that you can actually create a reveal or an inset on your work. So if this was your leg and this was your apron and you wanted it to inset you know, a certain amount, whether that be three quarter, half, whatever distance you wanted to inset that inside your leg or inside the frame, you would just use these spacer blocks and they come in from one sixteenth inch thick an eight, three eighths, three quarter, and then I think this one's an inch and half or an inch and five eighths, something like that. All you have to do is drop those in place over those thumb screws and then tighten them down. That gives you your reveal. So when you set this on your workpiece, it automatically gives you that offset, that 3 8 inch offset here or whatever one you put in there. It'll go ahead and put that offset in there for you. As far as keeping up with everything in with the Dowmax, I just used a rigid tool organizer that you can pick up at Home Depot or wherever. And that way I keep up with all the parts, pieces, dials, drill bits, everything that I need to use with the Dowmax stays right in this organizer. Y'all know I've been called the pocket hole king, but this Dowmax makes it so easy to use that this is my preferred joinery method if I'm gonna make something extremely strong and there'd be no signs of joinery there. You glue this up, man, this thing's gonna be there. It's super solid and it's easy to dry fit things with dowels. It makes everything super simple to use. 
It also comes with a 45 degree offset plate. I'm not sure if it comes with it or if it's an extra add-on. Wanna check on that. 45 degree plate will allow you to do things like uh, picture frames and other things like that, or any type of 45 degree angle you may need. I'm extremely glad to have this in the shop. It's small and it works extremely well. You put four to five dials in a piece, that thing's gonna be there forever. <laughs> or for as long as it can be anyway. Like it's extremely strong. If you wanna go see the Dial Max in action, check out the workbench build where I assembled the frame using the Dial Max. If you like any of the tools that were shown today, check the links in the description below and go check them out for yourself. They're gonna make your life a ton easier in the wood shop. First on the list is the new Masca Dial Jig X. Wait till you see what this can do. If you're just wanting to put two boards together like this, basically two butt joints together, the Dial Jig X is gonna be perfect for that if you don't wanna use screws and you just want a nice strong joint. Now all you have to do is take your drill bit with the included depth stop and then set the depth that you want. And this is a 5 16 inch drill bit, so you're gonna be using 5 16 inch dowels. Once you have the depth set, all you have to do is drill the two holes. So what this is gonna do is put dowels at opposing directions. It's gonna lock that board in without even having to glue. I would use glue, but you can actually get away with not using glue with this method because it's gonna lock it in. Let me show you. Now without glue, you're not gonna pull this apart because of the way those things are crossed in there. We'll do a cross section on the bandsaw. I'll cut that off and let you see how they lock in there. You're not gonna pull that apart. Now where you would want to use glue is because if it flexes this away, then you can start seeing that gap open up. So that's why you would wanna glue that if there's gonna be any pressures or twisting, anything like that on your piece. I would actually always recommend gluing, but if you didn't want to, then for whatever reason, this would lock it in. So that's what the cross section of the Dow Jig X looks like. You can see how it's locking that board in there. Now, if you glued all that and we cut that away, you would see basically the same thing, but the dowels would still be there. Super solid, super strong joint. A couple of really good practical ways to use the Dow Jig X is to build furniture with it. I think like joints like this, you could use the Dow Jig X to go through and shore both of those up, all of these joints on the top and the bottom using this dial jig X. When I built this, I built this old shop stool out of pocket holes. It's pretty simple, but the dial would give it a unique look. So if you were building bar stools, stuff like that, and you didn't want those pocket holes exposed and you wanted a very inexpensive dialing jig, this may be the way to go. I think another interesting use case for this dial jig X would be building drawers. Instead of using pocket holes or just glue, you could actually use this to add a little accent to the side of your drawers kind of dovetail-esque, you know, just have those uh, nice contrasting colors on the edge of drawers. I think that's a really cool use for it. I think that would make a very strong and nice looking drawer. You could also use this to repair drawers. You know, sometimes those drawer faces are actually built into the sides and if they come off, this could be a good repair tool as well. This is a solid block of aluminum and it does have those hardened steel drill guides. So you're not gonna wear this thing out. You're not gonna worry about dropping it and breaking it. I mean, it's just, it's just a piece of aluminum, so it's gonna be solid. What's extremely interesting to me is that this is like no other dial jig. Most all other dial jigs are 90 degrees into the piece that they're drilling into. The dials are 90 degrees in there. These are at a very sharp angle both ways. You can see here how it's kind of opposite each other. It just makes sense. It's gonna lock in there. I've also been thinking about this dial jig X being used to create splines in 45 degree pieces. I think it would work. Uh, maybe if you could find a way to clamp that on there. It's just very interesting to have a new tool like this to come along and figure out interesting ways to use it. Now this Dowjig X was actually made by Daniel Herman and Masca helped him bring it to market. They're doing a really cool thing where they're helping woodworkers bring their inventions and get them into the public. So really cool of Masca to do that. And they sponsored this video, so thank you Masca. I can't wait to see what you make with your Dowjig X. Be sure to tag me on Instagram at 731 Woodworks. Next on the list, you just saw me use it actually, it's the Suzanne Flush Cut Trim Saw. I love this little saw because it's under $30 and it cuts both hardwood and softwoods. And if you ever get confused, it's labeled which teeth are supposed to cut which type wood. A more coarse tooth for the hardwoods, a finer tooth for the softwoods, super, super sharp, a very, very flexible blade on it and it just slices right through those dials and that's exactly what it's made for. You can also use it to cut small pieces of wood, things like that. It's kind of a fine detail saw, but for the most part, I'm using it to trim my dials off flush. 
and it doesn't leave a bunch of marring and cuts and things like that on your product. So it's just a really good high quality saw. Suizan makes some very good, very high quality saws. As a matter of fact, this one I think is maybe over 30, it may be under 30, but it's a foldable dovetail saw. It is made by Suizan. It's probably one of my favorite bigger saws, hand saws that I have. But for the dowels, that Suizan is just right. I'll go ahead and link to both of these in the description if you're interested, but I would highly recommend the smaller, and this one's awesome too. And I probably pronounced Suizan wrong, but I'm a redneck, so. Next on the list is this Rockler Bit Center depth gauge. It has a couple of functions that will make setting up a router or a router table much faster. Check it out. One of the main features I love about this setup gauge is the fact that it has both half and quarter inch notches that are perfectly half the distance. So all you have to do is use the shank of your router bit, slide it into that slot, and then you're able to set your fence exactly to the center of that bit. So if you want to cut dados, grooves, anything like that needed precise, this is what you need because it's gonna work perfect every time. Super easy to set up. It has this bevel indicator so you can get precise measurements on your setup and it has metric and imperial so no woodworkers left behind no matter which system you're on. It also features a depth gauge which you can use this on your fixed or plunge based router or at the router table to set the exact depth of any bit you're using. Under 30 bucks, this is a steel and it has a steel blade. If you ever tried to set up your fence to the center of a bit or to the edge of a bit using a, a tape measure, you can know that it can get a little frustrating. This will make your job or your life much easier. Next on the list are organization trays. These things are absolutely awesome and they're very inexpensive. You get a pack of 32 of these from small, medium, and large, under 30 bucks and I use them in a variety of ways. My resolution for 2022 was to get organized and I've used some of these as well as some other products like the tool wall, the tool cart, as well as this thing behind me to be able to actually organize the shop. These little organizers are just under two inches deep and they can hold a variety of stuff. You see here, I'm able to organize screwdrivers, my wrenches, random sockets, all of my CNC stuff, even a variety of drill bits that don't have a home are able to be put in these little containers and they lock together so you can organize them in your uh, drawer any way you want. And when you open the drawer, they don't just slide and move all over. I really like that feature on them. When you open the drawer, you can actually find what you're looking for and don't spend 10 minutes looking for that lost wrench or whatever you're after. So if you wanna get organized, especially in your shop drawers, I highly recommend these. They're really awesome. Next on the list, by far, by far, my favorite tape measure I've ever owned, so much so that I bought I thought four, but I can't find one, but such is the case in the wood shop. That's why I have three of these in the shop. And I swear I have four somewhere. These are the fast cap old standby. I like the 16 foot, but they also make them in 25 foot. These are really awesome because they have some really cool features that I really like in a tape measure. First and foremost, they're very durable. They have a padded, almost not really padded, but it's kind of a rubberized outside, but it doesn't squish, so it's a little more firmer rubber. But even if you drop it, these things are extremely durable. I drop them all the time. And speaking of dropping, right here on the front, I like how the blade is recessed inside there. So if you do drop them, they're less likely to bend that blade, causing inaccuracy. I also really like the clip. It has a nice spring-loaded clip, so it hangs on your belt or your pocket extremely easy. It's not so tight that you can't easily take it out. The markings are extremely easy to read on here, and it has a pencil sharpener built in. How cool is that? So you never have a dull pencil so long as you have one of these close by. And last but not least, you can customize them. I have my own Outlaw Board Butter sticker on mine, and the little two inch stickers fit perfect right there. Just a nice added bonus. If you'd like one of your own Outlaws Board Butter stickers to go on your new fast cap, link in the description. I like to scatter them all over the shop so I don't have to go looking for one when I need it. This is the Craig Routing Guide Set. This is a brand new tool from Craig, but this is one of those tools that I think is a game changer, especially if you don't have a router table. Now, a lot of times when you're making woodworking projects like cutting boards, charcuterie boards, or tabletops, things like that, you wanna put a round or a chamfered corner on them. This is an easy way to do it. 
Let me show you. So you can go all the way from a quarter inch radius, half inch and one inch, all the way to a two inch round radius on the corner. And then you get three chamfered type corners, half inch, one and two. I do wish there was a little more selection here between the half and the two inch chamfer corner, but you do have a nice selection of round corners, which most of us are gonna be using anyway. And you get this nice little case that'll actually keep these organized so you don't lose them. So you can keep them at the router table, in a shop drawer or anything like that. All you need is a flush trim bit or sometimes called a pattern bit. I really like this white side set. You can pick this up on Amazon. It has two flush trim bits, one with a bottom bearing, one with the top. And then you also get a, a round over bit and a chamfer bit for the most common bits you're gonna use. And these are excellent bits. They're gonna last you a very long time. A lot of radius jigs like this are, well, you have to hold them uh, pretty close to the edge. Your hand's right, right here next to the uh, jig itself. This I like because it has a knob. It's gonna keep my hand away from it. And you can swap these out. You're going to use the same jig every time. And these just snap right into place securely, too. Now we got a quarter inch radius. These also adjust. You can move these posts up to the next hole if you need to get closer to the edge. So on the long side, I don't need to adjust those posts because both of those are making contact. But on this short side, only one is, and that's going to give me not as much uh, grip as I want. So all you have to do is move this post. These are uh, threaded. You're going to move that down. And now that's gonna give me uh, two points of contact there as well as two points here. That's a nice secure grip. Now all I have to do is pull back on this and then use my router to go around that edge. If you don't wanna hold it and you just wanna clamp it down, then a face clamp will work just perfect to hold these in place. I've got my router bit installed. This is that white side we just saw from the pack. And I'm just gonna use that top bearing to follow this. That's gonna give me that quarter inch radius right there on the corner. Man, that worked perfect, perfect. So what if we wanted a bigger radius? We're gonna throw a one inch in there. I'm just gonna hold it this time and see how that works. Oh man, hey, I like this. Oh man, the customer decided they don't want to round over on the edge, so now they want that chamfer. Just pull that out, pop the one inch chamfer in. Let's run this through. Now that's all right. This little dude is impressive. It has a grippy pad on the bottom. There's a rubber grip pad. It's gonna help hold that tight to the wood so it doesn't slip on you. I like that it's one-handed. I can pull back pressure on this while using the router to go around that edge like you saw. Just super, super convenient, fast. Just one of those tools that you're like, why didn't I get this earlier? And plus it comes with all these different swappable radiuses that you're gonna be able to use on future projects. I just I'm a fan of this tool, especially if you have a good set of router bits like this white side bit. You can use whatever you want, but I highly recommend the white side. They do less burning, they're less tear out because they stay sharp longer. They're just good quality bits. And this whole pack is less than hundred bucks. So it's a super good deal for four high quality router bits. Uh, one thing to note on the top, it does have instructions or just a graphic to let you know which way the router should go, depending on whether you're using just a hand router or a router table. So I think that's pretty convenient and nice of them to do. To use this with the palm router or a trim router or just a regular router, you wanna get that bearing that's closest to the router. In other words, that bearing will ride along the edge of the corner radius template. Uh, if you're using it on the router table, obviously it would be the other way. You would use the bearing on the other end like this one. Shiny. Next on the list are detail sanders. I actually did a full review on this little Rikon sander. This thing's about a hundred bucks, give or take, uh, about a couple weeks ago. And this thing is really nice, but there's also a competitor now. This came out like a week after I bought this one. So I picked this up. This is the Milwaukee M12 Fuel orbital detail sander. Now it does have that triangle shape or home plate shape base on there. What that does is there's a 1.5 millimeter orbital sanding stroke. So it's going around, it's a fine detail sander. You're gonna be able to get a fine finish on there. They say a stain quality finish, which means you shouldn't have any of those circles in your finish. This thing comes with a ton of accessories too that I really, really like. If you'd like to see this one in action, there is a full video on that. I'll link it in the description below. This is a nice pickup for hundred bucks, but they're two different Tool, but they do do a similar operation. This has four speed settings, even though that the trigger is actually a variable speed trigger, which I really do appreciate. But you can limit the top speed just by choosing one, two, three, or four. So that last one was four, this one is one all the way. Two, three. 
So you can see that it just continues to go up in speed. Now what you get with this kit is the battery, the charger, and this tool, plus what you're getting is a sanding pad saver, which I would recommend using all the time. That'll keep that pad there from getting messed up. And then it also comes with a variety of sanding discs from 80 grit all the way up to 180, I believe, plus the contour pad. That pad's gonna allow you to do edges and things like that. This is an excellent, excellent tool. You can also pick up extra sanding discs or pads, nets, whatever you wanna call them, uh, to go with this. I really like this tool for hundred bucks. This is a great little sander that you can do a whole bunch with. And there's really no alternative out there to something like this that's not multiple hundred dollars, like six, 700 bucks. So for hundred bucks, this is just a good value. The problem is trying to get into corners and things with this. While it's an amazing little sander, it takes off material really well. You can get different size grits too. I really, really love this. You can actually tell the difference in the build quality of this versus this, just the instant you pick it up, the way it feels, the way it sounds. You can even just hear this way, this kind of grinds when it's moving. It's kind of that grinding noise. This doesn't make that. I make a lot of trades and things with the CNC, but just getting into uh, tight spaces, up into corners of things when you're sanding, right along that edge, you can't do that with an orbital sander. I'm finding myself picking this up all the time where I would normally pick up the orbital sander for a fast sand, this is one of those that you're just gonna grab because it's one, it's cordless and it just works. I like that they include this contour pad with this because a lot of stuff I make or you make probably has roundovers, chamfers, things like that. And the last thing you want to do when you're sanding, especially when you're getting close to finishing, you don't wanna break those corners or cause a flat spot. This will, this will actually contour to that. Use a higher grit sandpaper here and the fact that this is variable speed by the trigger, I can use less or more pressure there. Using that sander to sand those corners, edges, it's gonna keep those round overs on there and not break it down. It's just a super useful, handy add-on that they throw in. Before we get to number three, if you wanna build awesome projects using easy to follow step-by-step -step woodworking plans, we have those available on our store, 731woodworks.com slash store. Check them out. If you use the code five new tools, we'll give you 20% off any order. That includes the already discounted plan bundles. Go check us out. Next on the list is a company you may not have heard of is called Trigjig. They make some really cool products. They're more premium products, similar to the Woodpeckers line. If you're not a fan of red or you just don't like Woodpeckers, check these out. Now Trigjig is made in Great Britain, but they ship to the United States for free. And just so you know, I have zero affiliation with them. I get nothing out of showing you this other than I just think they're very, very cool. This is probably one of my favorite smaller squares. It's a little bit bigger than the Woodpeckers. I actually like that it's a little bit bigger. This has some unique features on it that you're not gonna see anywhere else. One, all of these are actually recessed on this side, so they're not gonna get wore off. So they're actually underneath. There's a little lip that runs around. You'll see this offset blade on the bottom. And what that's for is if you're laying out lines on a board, you can use one side, to, uh, this is 16ths on this side. You can see 15, 13, three, five, seven. So you know that this side is 16ths of an inch. And then if you flip that over, you can use this side to mark the one eighth. So you can actually lay out uh, lines in 16th inch increments. It also has a little 45 degree bevel. What that's great for is if you have boxes and things that have uh, roundovers or anything like that in the corner, you can actually use that and it won't interfere. I really like that feature. And of course, it's extremely accurate. It's very square. You don't have to worry about that. It's lightweight. It's all anodized aluminum and it's blue. It looks good. Next is the Trig Jig Angle Finder 4. I love this thing. This is my favorite angle finder uh, versus something similar to what you would say like a T-bevel, things like that. Sometimes, man, these things just seem like uh, I would set the angle and then it moves too easy. And this, of course, this is a cheaper one. This is super awesome. I love that it has the miter on that side and the single miter on this side it has a protractor up top. So you got 180, 0, 90, so we know that we're at perfect straight line. And then you can move that to whatever angle. So if you're setting angles uh, for furniture or build projects, anything like that, you have to go inside and get an angle. When you come back out, you can set your saw up exactly like it needs to be. This thing holds its position too, doesn't move. I really like that feature. It's kind of a, it's not it's so stiff you can't move it, but it's stiff enough that it holds the angle without worrying about it, unless you bump it, of course, but just 
or my normal everyday use, just getting the angle right, this thing is awesome. I just think they're very unique tools. They're very well made, on par, equal to the Woodpecker's line. So if you know that line of quality of tools, you're getting the same thing here, equal quality. They're extremely nice. They do come at a cost, but they are very nice tools. And of course, the Pocket Square also has all those little holes in there for layout lines, things like that. Next on the list is the jack clamp. This thing is uh, pretty cool. It's made in the USA. This was sent to me by jack clamp uh, quite a while ago. I've had this thing for a while. Uh, I just never showed it on the channel. This thing is a clamp and a spreader and or a jack. It will jack or hold up to 300 pounds. It does have a lifetime warranty uh, from defects. And if you don't like it in the first 30 days, they'll actually give your money back. So you can try it without worrying about uh, if it's gonna be for you or not. This thing actually reverses. So right now I've got it in the hoist position. So it jacks it up. But if you flip this around, you can adjust this to give you more uh, clamping area and then you have a traditional squeeze clamp so it's kind of a, a jack get it jack of all trades it both clamps as well as spreads there are attachments for these things that will allow you to uh, clamp round stock it's just a metal attachment that slides right onto this foot and then there's also a spreader attachment so if you're doing decking things like that it'll, it'll go between the decking you can spread those out to get the equal spacing that you need this is a very well made clamp Everything about it feels nice and robust. The metal is, is thick enough that it's not gonna bend on you. And you can really feel how good this is made right here in the squeeze action. It just, there's no slop in it. It's just a really well-made clamp. One thing I find useful about this is it has this foot on there that you can attach and then it'll stand up on its own. What will that be good for? If you've ever built furniture by yourself and you need something to be held up, especially up off your workbench, this is perfect for that. It's gonna be able to hold that in place while you drive screws or get your measurements and attachments, things like that. A couple of these in the shop are super handy to have. This is to clamp round stock. So if you're cutting dowels or pipe, things like that, this will slide right on there. Well, now you have a V for that pipe or that dowel to ride in. And then when you use the other end to clamp back down, going to sandwich that in there for the round stock. It's a really good idea. It's also worth noting that Jack Clamp is a small family owned business right here in the USA. So they don't sell them on Amazon or anything like that. You have to buy them direct, but you are supporting a small family owned business. Number five on the list is another Trig Jig product. I like I never got that out. It has some unique features on it that I gotta show you. This is a Trig Jig pocket square and it has some unique features that you're not gonna find on any other square that I've seen before. And it's those slotted holes marking the angles. Now, why are those slotted? Well, they're made specifically for a carpenter's pencil, which I really appreciate because you carpenters out there don't really get a lot of these unique features a lot of times. The woodworkers usually get uh, the features they want, which are like holes that are made for pencils. But the carpenter's pencil don't get enough love. But now you can mark these uh, lines like that, and then you can just use this as a pivot point. Pivot. pivot! So for instance, if I needed to mark this 30 degree line, I can do that with my carpenter's pencil, and then I can use this as a pivot point. Pivot. And I can mark that 30 degree line there. It also has the round holes for pencils, just like you would if you needed to lay out parallel lines. And I like the fact that the end scale goes all the way to the bottom because now we can use this to set up router bits as well as blade heights and many other things that are useful in the shop. And it is a square, so you can use it just like you would a regular square. Number one on the list has to be a track saw. They are stupid expensive for what you think you're getting, a rail and a circular saw, but it's much more than that. And the reason it is because a track saw rides on that track, you're getting a perfectly straight and 90 degree cut on quality track saws every single time. You don't have to worry about, is it gonna be straight? Is my straight edge gonna move? Is my straight edge gonna bow? These things work perfect every time. And that's why I love having a track saw in the shop. It's one of those tools that you look at and you think, man, do I wanna spend that money? If you regularly cut tabletops that are thick and you wanna put bevels on there or just a 90 degree cut on like two inch wood, these things are perfect for that because you're gonna get a perfectly straight line every single time. Now for years, I used a straight edge and a circular saw and that worked okay, but it wasn't always perfect, especially on longer runs. Whereas something like a good quality track saw, I've had zero issues with. Now some of the budget options 
I get a little bit of uh, accuracy issues with in certain applications. That's why I say the more expensive ones, you really do get what you pay for here. My suggestion is either Festool in Milwaukee. Both of these are extremely well made and they work extremely nice. But the Milwaukee is an excellent saw with zero issues. I've really enjoyed having the shop so much so. I've got both of them. I can't get rid of this one. I use them about equally amount. I'll use one one time and one the other. So either one of these you'll be good with and Milwaukee's do go on sale from time to time. So be sure to keep up my tool deals website. I'll link that in the description. One B on these track saws. If you get a track saw and you really want to speed things up for yourself, check out the TSO GR16 PEV2. <laughs> There's a lot of words there. This is a guide rail square and essentially what this is going to do is turn your track saw into a giant speed square in other words you can only have to use two sides this plus the track to square it up on the sheet good that you're cutting and then a square you don't have to worry about lining up each end of the track so it speeds things up a lot and this new version fits both the Festool in Milwaukee as well as several others. They do have a Craig version that you can get that's separate because the Craig tracks are different, but I'll link to this one as well. The great thing about this track square is it slides right on, clamps down, and that's it. It's literally that easy. It takes it two seconds to put on and two seconds to take off. That's why I love having this in the shop. I have a whole video on five track saw accessories you need. If you have a track saw, I'll link that at the end of this video. You can go check it out for yourself. Next on the list, a ridiculously expensive tool are dust extractors, but I think they are 100% worth the price. Now, I've had the pleasure of using both the 3M and the Festool dust extractors, and they're both really good at what they do, especially if you get the 3M dust extractor from Tay Tools. I'll link that in the description. He sends a bag with his where you buy them elsewhere that you don't get that bag, and I have a whole video on that too. I didn't realize how much I would appreciate a dust extractor and why it's a little different than just a regular shop vac. I like dust extractors so much. I have one here at the workbench that I use for sanding, the domino, the track saw, the routers, whatever I'm gonna be using here at the workbench. And I have another one at the miter saw station because it works so well. Now, if I'm recommending a dust extractor to rule them all, I think the CT48 is probably the best pick. It has like 48 liters, whatever that means, of capacity. It's a really nice size capacity, hold a lot of dust. Now, at the miter station, I wanted something smaller, so I have the CT36, also an excellent choice. They both have this exact same CFM. In other words, they have the same suction, so you're not losing out anything there. One thing I love about this one is the fact that I can dial up or down the amount of suction it has. It's on auto, so anytime that I start up a tool that's connected to the switch here, like my sander, it powers itself on and off with the switch of the tool. Or you can opt for the Bluetooth accessory where you can put a button on the end of your hose like I have here, so you can push that on and off when you need it. That's how I use it with a track saw and domino and things like that so that I can turn it on and off when I need it and don't have to worry about trying to unplug my sander. Now where the dust extractors made a huge difference in the shop is dust collection and the fine dust, the microscopic one micron dust, whatever you call it, really, really tiny dust particles. They get in the air, get in your lungs, they're super dangerous. I've seen much, much less fine dust all over the shop ever since I got this one almost two years ago now. This is by far one of the most recommended tools I could offer to tell you to go get if you don't have one yet, especially for the sander because the sander is creating that really fine dust. But it also works well on bigger tools like my miter saw. I just love having them in the shop. Speaking of the miter saw station, the Festool Capex is like $1,600. I honestly don't think it's worth that much money, even though I paid that much money for it. I think that it's way overpriced for what you're getting. Yes, it's an absolutely amazing saw. I love it. I think it's probably one of the best saws on the market, but it almost doubled the price of the competitors. I just don't know why I paid double for it. I actually call it a fanboy tax because that's basically what you're paying for the Capex in my opinion. Number three on the list has to be a table saw. Now table saws and track saws can do similar things, but they are very different. I have a whole video on track saw versus table saw if you wanna check that out. A table saw is crazy expensive, especially when you first start looking at them and you've only purchased cordless tools up until this point. You look at something like this and wonder why it's $300. Now this is a very inexpensive table saw comparatively. And I have, this is my pick for a budget option, small space. I have a skill table saw that I reviewed that I think is a really good option for about the same price. 
It's a full size table saw, but if you're looking for a premium table saw, that's when you start getting into big money, but most of the time you're getting what you pay for. When you start looking into premium table saws, then saw stops got to come into the equation for most people simply because of the safety, but they're not the only game in town. There are other really good table saws out there to choose from. Harvey makes a good table saw. I've heard good things about the Laguna line and as well as Grizzly line of table saws and there's Powermatic. Like, there's tons of choices for you when you start looking at these options. I've got the saw stop three horsepower PCS. I've been in nothing less than impressed with this saw. Plenty of cut capacity at 36 inches, which is plenty of for me in my space. Now if I could have had the space for 52, I would have got that, but this fits my space nicely. Plenty of power at three horsepower and it's super accurate, which is what the main thing you have to look for in a table saw is you have to have an accurate fence and this thing is dead on all the time once you set it up you're good it does have micro adjustments if you ever need to adjust that but i've been absolutely 100 percent pleased with this saw and the fact that it has flesh sensing technology gives you a little bit of peace of mind said so should you slip up should you accidentally touch that blade when it's going uh, you should not encounter any major damage unless something catastrophically fails, which I don't know that they've ever had that happen. That's one of the main reasons I would have a hard time recommending other brands just because of that. I have a whole video on the haters guide, the saw stop goes into the patents, etc. That's neither here nor there in this video. But if we're being honest, most woodworkers, I would assume, especially garage hobbyists are never gonna spend $3,000, $4,000 on a table saw because it's kind of pointless to do that. But I do think if you're gonna be doing this for multiple years to come, you do owe it to yourself to check out some in the eight to $1,500 range there's a lot of good options i'll link to some of my favorites what i would choose in that range in the description if you're interested number four on the list i got to put chisels in here because they are ridiculously expensive when you start looking at quality chisels in other words the narex richter lines the one i actually recommend for most people two cherries a sandvik you name it, there's several other brands out there, but to me, I think best bang for the buck is the Narex brand. There's been a lot of tests and reviews done on these chisels, and they seem to always come out in the upper spots for most people. The main reason you're paying bigger money for chisels like this is the steel that they use. If they use lower quality steel, it doesn't hold an edge. You can't get them flat, and they just dull really fast where when you spend a little extra money on really quality chisels, you're getting a nice metal that's really hard that doesn't dull very fast. It's kind of a happy medium there where it's also not so hard that you can't sharpen them with a fair amount of ease. I have a whole video on sharpening chisels too, but for the most part, you're paying for that happy medium in the perfect metal. There is such a thing where you get, it's not too hard, it's not too soft, kind of like Goldilocks of chisels. Number five on the list has to be a jointer. A jointer is one of those tools that when you look at them, they're very expensive for basically two operations they can do, edge and face joint. If you don't have a jointer, there are ways to get around it. I made a video on how to do this. I'll link that at the end of this video and in the description. But for the most part, this will make your life much easier and make your work much, much faster, which is what this really accomplishes. Speed, efficiency for your shop, especially if you have a board that has a twist in it or even a bow in it or the edges aren't straight and you're making a lot of panels, cutting boards, things like that. This is where this thing is going to really up the game in your woodworking life and it makes the price of this tool well worth it in my opinion because these are upwards of $500 or more depending on which model you get. Eight, 10 inch, even a six inch model is quite pricey. is a set of eye gauging setup blocks that has a ton of setup blocks in there so you can pretty much dial in anything you want. So this set goes from 1 16th of an inch all the way to 1 half inch in these small blocks and then of course you get the 1 2 3 block. If you look at the quarter inch block it has the quarter inch printed there which I really like because that allows you to know that that's one quarter inch thick. Some of the wider ones will have the arrows pointing to let you know that this is the distance you're measuring 7 16 this is one quarter, but they also have them printed on the face. And you can rest assured that these are extremely accurate as shown here with my digital caliber. All of these that I checked, dead on. Starting at the router table, this is gonna let you set your bit heights and your fence distance. Also at the table saw, you're gonna be able to set your saw blade depth exactly where you want it or the fence distance 
especially using the 123 setup block. A 123 setup block is almost a must have in the shop because they are so useful. You can use them as a standard square. You can also set up blade heights and fence distances with these. And what I really like about the eye gauging one is there is a very accurate scale on two sides, the three inch side and the two inch side. That is a perfect way to set the depths and the bit heights of anything that you're gonna be using in the shop. I love this feature on this eye gauging 123 block versus a standard like 23 hole 123 block. These things are absolutely perfectly square so you don't have to worry about that. And you can use those again as a square to set up your fences or anything else. Now this set is in freedom units, so if you're looking for a metric set, this is not those. But these do go from 1 16th inch all the way to half inch, and you can combine those in any orientation you want to get the depth you need. They also come in this very nice plastic case with foam insert to keep them organized, so you can keep them in a drawer and don't lose them. They are made of anodized aluminum, so they're going to hold up very well in your shop. And Mike Taylor at Tay Tools knows I love my setup block, so he offered to send me these to check out. You got to check them out at Tay Tools, small family owned business, you'll be supporting him. I'll put a link in the description and the pinned comments to this set and any other tools you see today. This attachment turns your sander into either an exact 90 degree sander or a bench top style disc sander. This was sent to me by a small maker just like you, McFarland Customs. He has an Etsy store where he sells these at and he has them for multiple models, DeWalt, Rigid, Makita, 3M, and I think that's all for now. I'll link to the store in the description, you can go check them out. But this will allow you to take your sander and make it an exact 90. So if you're building tabletops or cutting boards and you need that exact 90 degree, you don't want it to be off, especially trying to manually hold that at a 90 degree angle, sometimes it gets a little frustrating. You don't get that perfect 90 that you're wanting. This will stop any user error that you may have because it is an exact 90 degree angle to your sanding disc. As you can see, there's plenty of clearance around the sander without being too much. Now he also sells this little attachment that allows you to easily convert this to a disc sander that you can just clamp it to your bench or there are screw holes there that you can screw it down. Now the way this works is there's two basically studs sticking up out of the back that matches the bolts that come with your Exact 90 that locks that in place in the backside. And then there's a security bar on the front that basically locks into those slots as you see there. So it locks in nice and solid, had zero issues with it. This is a great way to be able to sand small parts without having a big oscillating or belt sander or something like that in your shop. And it just uses a tool you already have. Now these exact 90s do come with everything you see. You get the U-bolt that goes around the sander. You also get the 90 degree part as well as two bolts and even a supplied wrench to help you kind of snug them up. You don't want to over tighten this, just snug it about a quarter turn past snug. Again, if you buy one of these, you're supporting a small maker just like yourself. So I give this a thumbs up. One thing I like about this setup is it's easily installed and removed. So if you don't want it on there or you're not going to use it, but just for a few minutes, put it on there, use it and take it back off. You still got your sand. <laughs> You may know that I am a Woodpeckers fan. I have Woodpeckers tools in the shop that I bought and never been sponsored by them. These may be the closest rivals I've ever seen at a fraction of the price. Now Mike Taylor Tay Tools knows that I like the Woodpeckers brand, but he said, you gotta check these out. Let me send you a set. Let me hear what you think. I'm impressed y'all because these are aluminum based, but they are a stainless steel blade. So you don't have to worry about corrosion and they have a ton of features packed in. Now this set comes with a seven inch and a four inch but then you can buy them separately if you wish. Each one of these squares have holes in them at eighth inch increments so that you can draw parallel lines to the edge of your stock, which is great for layout. I also like how easily these are to read. They're a satin finish, even though it's stainless steel, it's not too shiny, so it doesn't glare on you. And you just got those graduated marks all the way up the long side of that triangle, all the way from zero to 90. That helps you lay out angles. I love the fact that they thought of two ways to get measurements off of this as far as on a square goes. If you look, the scale starts at the top side of the base going up the scale. So when you lay that on the edge of the stock, you're measuring from the edge of the stock up. However, if you turn the square on its edge, the scale starts at zero here. So you can use this edge to set up blade heights, bit heights, fence distances, anything like that. Notice that the blades are also offset from center and what that's gonna allow you to do is mark for center of a three quarter inch stock or lay out mortise and tenon on three quarter inch stock. As far as the scale accuracy on these squares, you're getting extremely accurate measurements. At 0 .0015 of an inch, that's, you're not gonna notice any deviation there woodworking. And the squareness of each square is plus or minus 0 .005 thousandths of an inch. I mean, you don't need any more accuracy than that. Building most 
any common woodworking project, the wood's gonna move more than that. Each square even has a hole in it just made for hanging it up. So you can keep them up off the workbench and safe. They even include instructions and a mechanical pencil with extra lead. <laughs> Again, probably the closest competitor to Woodpecker's quality and accuracy that I've seen at a fraction of the cost. You gotta check them out, taytools.com, link in the description. Next up is the dopest router base you've ever seen. It comes from Wood Grain Junkie. I purchased something from him on Etsy that I'm working on for a future build video, and he included this router base for the DeWalt. He saw it used on the channel. He said, I hope you enjoy the trim router plate. I included the sub base with a grip as an added thank you. Thank you, Wood Grain Junkie. If you compare it to the other base, the base that comes with the router, you see how much more support you're getting on that router by using one of these aftermarkets. He has no idea I'm making this video and didn't ask me to. I just thought it was a really nice base, really thick, 3 8 inch, and it's well made. It has a really nice handle. This is a very well made router base, especially to give you some extra control when you're doing roundovers and chamfers, even on small items like this guitar tray. It gives me a little extra control, a little extra base, enough to keep this router upright in a perfect 90 degree to what the stock I'm working on. I really like this base and it's why I included it in this video. If you want to support a small maker, if you want to check out some of the dopest accessories you can find for a router and more, check out his Etsy store. I'll link to it in the description. This is a really good product. He has no idea I'm making this video. I just think it's great to be able to bring light to small makers making really good products, especially when they have no idea you're doing it. Y'all give him some love, link in the description. Next up, a next level woodworking tool that will really speed up your processes. And you may have seen it hanging back here. This is the TSO GRS 16 PRV2. Got real square. <laughs> you may have seen this in my previous video, the five track saw accessories you need, but this is the newest version. TSO did send me this to check out, but I've always been impressed with their quality, and this one is no different. This new version, this exact square here, will fit Festool tracks, Milwaukee, Triton, Makita, as well as Powertech tracks. So if you have any of those tracks, this will work for you. Now, if you have the Craig tracks, there is a Craig version of this as well, or a Craig track square that they have. Now to put this on is super, super, stupid simple. All you do is slide it into the track. This clip will lock over your track and lock it in place. This pulls everything square, perfectly square. So you got a giant speed square now and it won't damage your track. And there are notches so your track clamps still work with this install. Now the reason I like this version is you can use it on either end of the track so it doesn't matter which side you put it on, just depends on what your preference is. This makes breaking down sheet goods extremely fast because you only have to line up one side because this is a square. All you have to do is slide it down your material, make the cut. Slide it down the material, make the cut. This thing is very nice to have, will save you a ton of time. These are extremely high quality tools that will last you forever, so long as you take care of them, don't drop them, don't run over. These carry a five-year warranty and are made right here in the USA. We'll show you five tools you've never seen before. We're here at AWFS, the largest woodworking show in North America. Let's go. All right, I'm with Miss Becky Hope yep. Uh, yep. with Hoffman yep. Joinery Systems. Yes. She's gonna give us a demo on a machine that makes making frames and other joinery much easier, faster, simpler, yep. just all around cool. Very strong too. Easy way we do this is with our keys. Once you figure out how your size that you need, like you can see on our keyboard right here, we have the different lengths. This is the main one, this is the 5 8 This is just the one that most people use. That's how you set your depth. You use your key, set it right here, you line it up and you lock it down. And now you can see right here, that acts as a stop. So that's how it's gonna come up and route from the bottom. You move this plate and you set it up here, you're gonna have a mirror image. So it's gonna cut at the same spot. I'm lining it up right here, I'm locking it down, and now I'm ready to go. And the keys, they're tapered, so they go down in it, just like the rounded end goes down, and you just hammer it in there. And then there's your angle. And this is, has no glue in it. And you can see how strong it is. Like I'm pulling it and it pulls it real nice and tight. You said you could do doubles. Yeah, just like this one. 
you would make two different passes and that's why see these double rulers on here yep. this one also has a digital so that helps you line up like you would know this one right here this is where you're doing that pass you can do your use your digital or you can even use your ruler and after you make both of those passes for the next one then you would line it up and do your next pass gotcha. That's what's good about the digital one, if you have multiple passes. You said this new Matic unit, how much is the price point on it? This one runs you about 5300 and that is with the digital, um, the digital read and the pneumatic. And then if you jump down over here to um, a manual one, you're, you're looking at about 3900 And that one also has a digital read. We have them without the digital read. I see that we've got different joinery methods here. Over there, they're on like keys, basically on the miters. And you said we could also do butt joints with it? Yeah, you can. This one we done with a pen, but you would want to just do with the pencil mark. We also have different plates. If you're going to do um, butt joints, you could have a flat plate if you had a bigger piece if you want, but this one would still butt up against it, and you would just use your mark and your center line right here. That would help you line it up. This has been ripped, so it's right here, and it, it you can't even tell. It looks oh, like okay. it was just put in the middle, but so it was actually, panels. yep, you can. Or you just sure can. Design. And and we also offer wood keys so that if you wanted to do it for a design, this one is done for both. They wanted it. Some people um cabinet doors right. like the little bow tie, the look of it. Yeah. And some people don't want it to show. They just want it because of how strong it is. Yeah. We also have quite a few frame builders that they like it because when they ship them, they can ship them not assembled. Yeah, flat yeah. and then they can just hammer them in. So it's awesome. it's really nice. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, we're here with Kingston from Rip It, Rip It Fence, yep, and they have an automated rip fence for your table saw. So it's got a keypad, it's just a regular fence in a lot of ways, but with a keypad and a motor, and you type in on the keypad to, uh, to move it over into place. So say you want to cut like 24 inches, you type 24, move, goes in, locks into place. As far as like calibrating to know like what's zero and where the blade is at, you can automatically calibrate by typing auto home and then it'll go and move towards the blade and feel the force back from the blade and know that that's zero. Oh, that's cool. And then you can also manually calibrate as well. What table saws would this fit on? Pretty much any table saw. Especially if you have a Bisa Meyer, you're already used to the uh, angled aluminum or iron. If you take off the angle, you take off the rail and then you put on this uh, this assembly. So what we're selling is the fence plus the assembly of the rail and everything. Is this a saw stop it's all now? It is, yeah. Okay. Is it just one size fits all or how does it work? Okay, so we have different standard lengths that we're planning on selling. Theoretically, you can just cut it and use any length. So, but we have 52 inch is probably the minimum and then we can go from there. And we're kind of waiting to hear from people as far as like what the most common lengths are, but we can do any length of rail. Will it also work left side of the blade or only right? Yes, it will work on the left side of the blade. Okay. You just tap left on the settings and then everything's reversed and it moves to the left. Nice. I see you, you got a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, just launched. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Really? Just launched today. So we're trying to get to 150 as quickly right. as possible. So that's your goal, 150? Yeah. We want to get above that. Right. There's a lot of other things like people have asked for different features. Right. We want to add some of those. So like, you have you possibly could have more features coming to this. Yeah. Like like cutlass. Like you could import oh, cutlass. So you don't have to like type it in. You have a design for like a cabinet or something and you just send that off and then all your cuts are imported into the fence and you just tap on it and it moves there and you cut your you know whatever you're cutting and that's it. And I'm assuming this is dust resistant. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's been through the ringer. Yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate yeah. it. This is Mr. Alex from Invis by Lamello with a very cool joinery system I've never seen before. Give us a demonstration. Yeah, Thanks for stopping by. Yes, we have an invisible detachable joiner, which means that we have a screw that you can turn with a screwdriver that looks a little bit different. And if you look at that one, See how it's turning. So you open and close it the same way you would do it with a screwdriver. This is what the screw looks like and it's inserted into the wood so that on the other side you just have a receptacle thread. If you put these two things together, they're hard but joined together like for a stair rail, you can release it again. Same thing here, I have two screws that I use Put a panel onto cabinet work. Uh, 
I could do a, a stair rail, I could do a leg to a table. You said, uh, we was talking about the dowel kit, you can do this with dowel joinery, basically, or? It's, it has to be dowel accurate, so these two pieces have to just match and cut together so that they can be fastened and released again. And we have a complete kit that has everything that you need as a starter kit here at the show for $5.94. Usually at the retail is about $50 more. It comes with a jig, comes with the drill, comes with the mini mag, which fastens and loosens these, and it comes with 20 joiners in the kit, all in a sustainer kit. Awesome. Where, where can we find these at? Best way is to go to our website. That's www.swissinvis.com. Yes. Okay. Mr. Okay. Alex, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very cool. Thanks for stopping by. I'm here with Mr. Sheldon Smith. His tool company is called Outlaw Tool Company, so we had to stop and say hello, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. So this is your system you invented on cutting crown molding, right? Yes. Can you show me how it works? Yeah, absolutely. It's a three-step system, very simple. It's not only the best teacher, but the best, most accurate cutting system. So all you have to do is three simple steps. When Whichever crown molding you have, spring angle crown molding is 30 uh 52 45 and 38 so we have three different jigs we have a 52 a 45 and a 38 that does it for you once you get the right jig in the saw the second step is to measure your corner we have a patented protractor it's the only one ever invented where the scale has been manipulated to speak the same language as your saw instead of a 360 degree language right so it makes it real simple so you just measure the corner divide by two that's your saw setting. The third step is we have an atom, actually a patented picture system that shows you how everything sets up so you don't have to think upside down and backwards. And once you get to the third step, you're right here, then the patented system that only makes you perfect, the only system ever where you don't move the saw. Instead of moving the saw, you reverse the jig, reverse the molding, and make a perfect mirror image cut every single time. So it's the only system that makes you perfect automatically without trying. We also have a special roller for your long molding that holds you up in place so everything's stable in both directions without having to readjust. So that's how our system keeps everything stable and makes all your cuts perfect. So if somebody wanted to check this out, where they find it at? You can get it at outlawtoolco.com. That's the only place we're not in stores because it has to be demonstrated. Okay, good. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, so I'm here with Steve with RZ Mask, and you all have a brand new mask that's launching today. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We call it the M3. The M3. So I have the M2 right now. Okay. What's different? Well, what's different about this one here is we actually took the main part of the mask and we actually designed three different straps to wear it. We have a ear loop strap, neck strap, and a two strap. So this way you can actually have one mask, wear it three different ways. And what's really, really cool, what we like about this too, is that no more replacing your valves. This is the filter replacement. It's got a four snap little uh, rivet system. So you can take these in and out of your mask in about 15 seconds. And also another really cool uh, attribute of it this thing here, fit tested, typically you gotta get 100 to pass. This reached uh, scores up to 800 on well, parts of the fit test. It comes with uh, the mask, three straps, the filter replacement, and a pretty cool little uh, belt bag. Can you just tell me if we don't have to replace these uh, valve things anymore? Nope, nope, those days are long gone. So this, uh, you buy the filter, and when you replace it, you just attach it with the rivets, and away you go. Fast. And this here is talking about fit factor you was talking about just a minute ago? Yep, this is the fit factor on it. And uh, basically, you know, it's just, it, it exceeds fit, fit, fit testing about, you know, three times on average. And then what's really cool is we have over 12 international U.S. patents on this mask. Very yep. cool. Thank you. I'll be checking this out. Where can awesome. we get this at? rzmask.com? rzmask.com. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Number one on the list is the Craig Track Saw. This thing is fantastic. You should have one of these in your shop if you break down sheet goods. It's almost a must have, let me show you. When you see this, you think circular saw, most people do, but it's different because it runs on this track. This track is super secure. It's not gonna move off of that track unless you move it off of that track. It has to actually be picked up off of there. It's called a plunge saw or a track saw. The reason is it plunges down. You would want to turn it on, have the blade spinning before you plunge, and then you'll make your cut. 
Well, you'll notice right here, it has a riving knife, very similar to your table saw. And that's gonna prevent that wood behind it starts pinching that blade and causing binding up. That causes kickback. So this helps prevent kickback. This also has an anti-kickback feature. You look here on the bottom, right there, there is a little switch on the top that activates the anti-kickback. What does that do? That prevents the saw from moving backwards. I have to really pull to make this thing come back. If I turn that off, it slides easily back and forth. It also has an anti-splinter guard right here that keeps the plywood and things you're cutting really smooth and keeps just a good smooth cut and keeps those things from fraying and breaking off like you see a lot of cuts. Another great feature is you can actually just set the depth of the plunge, a positive stop here. So it's even got a marking for three quarter inch plywood because that's a common thing that you're gonna be cutting with a track saw. You set that on three quarters of an inch and it's going to plunge just enough to cut through three quarters of an inch plywood. You can also make bevel cuts from zero to 45. Actually, you can go to 47. There's a switch here that overrides and you can go over to 47. And you can also go the other way, override and go to negative one. Now, why would you want to do that? I don't know about your house, but in my house, nothing is square. It was never built square. So a lot of times when you come start building into corners and things, they're not actually square. They may be 46 or 47 degrees. So having this be able to cut at a bevel of 47 or negative one, helps you allow for those imperfections. This knob here actually adjusts the tightness on the track. So if you, if it's loose, you'll see that it has a little bit of play in there. If you tighten this down, then the play goes away. It's tight on the track. You're not have to worry about that causing any imperfections in your cut. It did a really, really good job. It's a super clean cut, just an excellent cut. The only thing I really don't like is I don't have more track. I would like to have another piece of track so I can be able to cut eight foot instead of the 60 something inches. But other than that, that's really the only downside I have so far. I am impressed. I have never used a track saw before. I didn't realize how fast this Craig track saw would be to set up, how fast it is to make the cuts. I broke down this sheet of MDF in a matter of minutes. I like the fact that I can just set this track on there. It's not gonna move. I just lined it up to my marks. I'm moving it off for the first time and there is, minimal dust under here. There's a little, but not much at all. And what's really impressive is I cut three cuts coming across here. And then this final piece is nine and seven eighths by nine and seven eighths. Exactly. That, that's impressive. If you'd like to see a full review of this track saw, comment below, let me know about that. Also be looking for maybe a giveaway on this one in the future. I'd like to thank Craig for sending this out to let me check out for this video. Next up are these little jewels right here. So there's a channel on YouTube called Shop Nation. I've been watching him for a long time. He makes awesome content. He also has an Etsy store that he sells a lot of stuff that he 3D prints, and this is one of them. These are battery hangers made for organizing your cordless tool batteries. He has them from Makita, DeWalt, Milwaukee, Rigid. Several lines of tools he has these hangers for. If you're interested in checking out Shop Nation's Etsy store, I'll drop that in the link in the description below. We're not partnered or anything like that. I just thought it was a cool tool and wanted to feature it on the channel. How cool is that? Perfect fit, not too tight, not too loose. They slip right on there. Perfect way to store my batteries now and get them off the shelf. What's really great about these, they attach very easily. I use one inch pocket hole screws on mine. You can use whatever you want. They'll also attach vertically like you saw me do on my workbench or horizontally if you wanna mount them under cabinets or if you have a charging station, something like that. Go check out our online store. We have easy to follow build plans to help you make awesome projects. Also be sure to check out Outlaw's Board Butter, help you condition, restore, and protect your cutting boards, wood utensils, and charcuterie boards. Board butter's so good, it should be outlawed. One of the coolest features of a dust extractor like the DeWalt or this Festool is the vacuum automatically comes on when you turn your sander on. But if you don't have one of these, what do you do? So what if you only have a shop vac? This is what you need. Very inexpensive, this is a timer. And what I like and the why I picked this one is it has a low shutoff time. The DeWalt, when I sand and I turn that off, it's 10 seconds, seven to 10 seconds before it actually shuts off. That doesn't seem like a lot of time, but it's annoying. When the wife walks in and she wants to ask me a question and I turn the sander off and the shop vac is still singing for seven, eight seconds, she gets tired and goes back in and I don't know that it's supper time. I missed it because 
she got tired of waiting. This is really easy to set up, super simple. Let me show you. The OT switch is actually a startup time delay. So in other words, when you turn your tool on, how long is it going to delay before it turns on your vac or your light or whatever you've got connected to it? You can go from 0.1 to three. We're gonna leave it at 0.1 because I want it to basically be instant. The CT button is the shut off. So how long do you want the tool or the vac running until it goes off? So we're gonna do one. So having that set at 0.1, it's almost instant that this comes on. This is the Festool connected to the Festool dust extractor. This is the DeWalt uh, connected through the switch to the rigid. Ready? It's a tie. They actually come on about the same time, they went off about the same time. Like they were so close I couldn't tell the difference. So that's pretty cool. That's probably one of the handiest things as far as power tools go in the shop is to have something automatically come on when you turn something else on, like your saws or your jointers or your sander especially. If you don't have a dust extractor that automatically comes on, I highly recommend one of these. This is the Polini pocket rule for woodpeckers. As far as woodpeckers tools go, this is very inexpensive and it's extremely handy to have in the shop. I did actually talk about this as a bonus on one other video, but I didn't go into a whole lot of detail about it. This thing has a lot of features stuffed into a little package. If you wear a shop apron, this thing was made for the shop apron because it goes right there, it's in the pocket. It's a pocket rule, that's what it's for. One thing I really like about the Poloni pocket rule is on the top, you see the 1 16th inch increments. On the bottom, it's 1 32nd. The increments are the same on each side. So 1 16th, 1 16th, 1 32nd, 1 32nd. This also has a slide rule on it that slides down. This is also aluminum, which I do like. And then you, it tightens down whatever measurement you want. This also doubles as a T-bevel. So if you're using this as a T-bevel, you can actually, there's a notch right there in the end that you can use to set the pencil lead in so that it doesn't move out of there. And it's just super simple. On this end rule, it's 1 16th. If you flip it over, it's 1 32nd over here. The little slide comes off and actually doubles as a stand so that you can use the end scale for router bits, table saw blades, etc. One thing I really appreciate about Woodpecker's tools is their accuracy. Another little cool tidbit of information is this is exactly one inch wide by one eighth inch thick. So you could actually use the one inch to mark a one inch line or just set things up. Last but certainly not least, a sanding accessory that's very inexpensive but extremely useful, especially to keep you from damaging corners and edges when you're sanding. This is a sanding pad, it's foam, it squishes down so that when you're sanding that edge, it actually collapses and doesn't let the sandpaper dig in and cause damage. This is probably one of the least expensive on the list, but I slaved it for last because I really like it. It's really good. This is a Festo brand. Don't worry about the name on this one. There's other brands out there. I'll link those in the description. They're equally as good. The way this works is if these hook and loop sticks to your sander, and then the sandpaper actually sticks to the sanding pad. As you can see that it actually compresses down on that corner. Will it damage the corner? Of course, if you're sitting there holding it on there or if you're not moving, it will still sand that corner or that edge. But if this was a round over and you didn't want to make it look ununiform, because a lot of times when you're sanding a round over, even if you think you're going moving fast enough and you're doing this, that doesn't work. You'll wind up with some imperfections, especially when you start putting finish on. So this actually prevents you from hurting it too much and doing damage unless you just hold it in one spot. If I don't want to round that over and I just, I want to take away that sharp edge like this right here, I was able to just sand that. All you're doing is moving the sander and it'll automatically do it because this sanding pad is compressing around that corner. If you watched my recent charcuterie board build video, you saw me use this pad in there and it was because I had rounded those over with an eighth inch round over and I wanted those to stay uniform. This is perfect for that. It's inexpensive and they just work. These are bench cookies, and I like these because they have a grippy rubber on them on the top and bottom, and these are perfect for elevating your workpiece while you route, and it keeps it from sliding and moving around the workbench. I use these all the time, nearly daily out here when I'm routing small pieces, just because of how useful they are and inexpensive. Number two are the Crag setup bars. I use these all the time for setting the height of my bits or even my blade on my table saw or the fence on the table saw. These are very, very useful. If I needed to cut a half inch groove in something, I need to set that straight bit. 
This notch is a half inch. This set goes from one eighth all the way up to half inch in 16th inch increments. So you have several different settings there. These are useful to set that bit depth accurately every single time and very fast. And they come in a nice case so you don't lose them. Here's a little secret for you. There are yellow hammer setup blocks that are identical, identical to the Craig with the exception of a couple of things. One, the color, obviously. The sizing is exactly the same. However, the yellow hammer is less expensive and it has measurements printed on on both sides so you don't have to look at one side or the other and i've noticed on my craig especially on the quarter inch they're starting to rub off that lasering on there is starting to dull a little bit haven't noticed that yet with the yellow hammer although i haven't used them as much as i have the craigs so basically it's going to come down to color choice but you can save a little money by going with the yellow hammer brand i've worked with yellow hammer for a while now they're a good company and again they look identical to me. The one thing the Craigs do have is a better case to keep them in. The yellow hammer ones are just a plastic box with foam inside where the Craig one has actual cutouts for each of the blocks. So if that matters to you. Number three is this Radius Guide. This is another Craig product. I bought this a few months ago and I love having this. You'll be able to create radiuses on the edge of your work. So cutting boards or even handrails on my outdoor bench I recently built. This is basically a pattern, just like we're gonna use a pattern bit. You can see in this footage here, extremely easy to use. A nice handhold to keep your hands out of the way of the bit you'll be able to make those radiuses in different sizes. This has both radiuses and flat angles on there, so you'll be able to make different profiles depending on which one of these you put in. They're easily swappable, pops right in and out. Now, if the Plastic Craig Radius Jig isn't your speed, they do make aluminum models. They're much more robust. They're gonna last a lot longer. And, uh, but the only bad thing is your fingers are much, much closer to that spinning blade. Uh, but if you're comfortable with that, it does have ledges locks onto the edge of that board. I've used these for a while, didn't have any issues, but I do prefer the Craig just for the safety aspect. But if you want some that'll last you a little longer, then these aluminum jobs might be your best bet. Number four is a router bit vise. These are extremely handy because one side is for tightening, one side is for loosening. And if you need to change the bearing out on an edge profile bit, you'll be able to put this in the vise. There's a half, eight millimeter and quarter inch shank sizes. When you drop this in there, it will not let it turn to the left on the loose side or to the right on the tight side. So you can loosen and tighten that tiny little bolt on top. Without trying to hold this little bit in your hand and trying to turn it, you just can't. So this is a really nice tool to have. Number five on the list is it's mine. I make this here at the shop. If you want to check it out, I'll drop a link to this or you can go to 731wimbleworks.com slash store. This is a router bit tray holder. Got places for quarter inch bits, half inch bits, even a caliper, wrenches, a pencil, and your router table pin. So it's a nice little compact router bit storage tray that you can use in the shop and made out of walnut. Now one thing I like to have is a set of brass setup blocks. These allow you to kind of stack them. You can add a half inch block and a quarter inch block. You got three quarters or any other combination you want. Half inch and three sixteenths, 11 sixteenths, right? So you can combine these in any orientation you want to get the exact setup that you want and make sure that it's gonna be exact every time. And all you're gonna do here is just use that by feel till you get that router bit at the exact right height. My personal favorite are these brass setup blocks from Tay Tools because they have the measurements stamped into them and a lot of them don't. They're just brass blocks at a certain dimension. These are accurate and easy to read. Next up is the Rockler setup gauge. This is a really handy gauge to have if you have a router table. It can be used on a regular router, but it really shines on the router table. A couple of reasons. Number one, it has two slots, one for half inch, one for quarter inch. That puts that bit right in the center of this gauge. It allows you to set up the fence exactly center of that bit. And that's one thing I really like about it, especially if you're cutting slots, different things like that. It's just an easier way to set it up. It also has a depth gauge, which you can use on a regular router, but you could also use that on your router table to set it. So if I was trying to cut a quarter inch deep slot with this router bit it's easy to set that up and if you're not in america using freedom units it does have millimeters on there so you can use those as well so it's dual purpose for dual places next up are edge guides if your router didn't come with an edge guide 99.9% .9 chance that there is an edge guide available for them buy it today these are one of the most used accessories for any router in my opinion i love having an edge guide for various work cutting grooves dados or dovetails or whatever you're cutting off the edge of a board i use these all the time and it's one of the main things i love about having a router it's like cutting the slots to put on the tabletop fasteners that's what i set the edge guide or the depth of that cut away from the edge of the board 
There's just multiple uses for these things. And if you don't have one already, go ahead and pick one up. Typically the edge guides you get with your trim router or even a budget model router are just gonna be plain unadjustable other than the slide that go in and out of the slots of your router. One thing I like about the DeWalt edge guide that I bought with the DeWalt is it has a fine tune right here so I can get the measurement close as far as sliding it in and out. And then when I get it where I need it or close to, I can dial that measurement in that if, way if I need to cut an, a groove or a dado at an exact right spot, this helps me do that. That's why I recommend that DeWalt fixed and plunge based router as one of your first routers you should buy. I've got a whole video about that. I'll link that in the description. Number one on the list is the PowerTech 5-in-1 setup gauge. You'll use this in the shop for various reasons. Number one, at the table saw, you can use these slots that are graduated at 1 8 inch increments to set up the height of your blade. Now, the only drawback to this is it won't set up on its own like the DFM setup gauge, but the DFM is a one use type tool and this is a five in one. So you just kind of weigh your options there. But it's really not that hard to hold it while you set your blade height. Number two, this sliding gauge will let you set depths or heights of things like router bits or you can do half laps or anything like that because the bottom is exactly whatever the top is. So if you're setting the, the bottom depth here, that whatever it's sticking out on the top is gonna be the same. Next is the side gauges on here is gonna let you set your bit heights at the router, fixed or plunge base, or your router table. This is really where this little gauge shines in my opinion. All you have to do is set this on top of your router table or the base of your router, set that bit height and you're off and running. Super easy to use. If you need to check the angle of your chisels, there are four places to do that on here. A 30 degree, a 60 degree, a 40 degree, and a 25 degree for those chisels. Also, if you sharpen your own drill bits, there's a few places to check the angle on those. Whether you're using 118 degrees, 98, 82, or 136. For under 30 bucks, this thing is handy as a shirt pocket. Next up is this Infinity Router Bit Vice. If you don't have one of these, this is a finger saver. This is a must have. If you have router bits and you need to change those bearings out, it has slots for quarter inch, eight millimeter, and half inch size bits. And what this does, one side is for loosening the bolt that holds that bearing in, the other side is for tightening it back down. If you've ever tried to hold one by hand and break that loose, sometimes it's impossible. You don't wanna use pliers on the shaft of that router bit because it's going to tear it up. It's going to basically make indentions and tear that metal. So you want something to hold that without messing it up. And that's where this comes in. It has a one-way grip in there. So on one side, it's loosening. When you put that on there, that's going to allow it to turn to the right, righty-tighty, but it will not let it go left for loosening. It's going to catch. So you'll be able to take and remove that bearing easily. Then when you get ready to put one back on, if you're swapping sizes, you're just gonna flip that around, use the tightening side. That will allow it to go lefty loosey, but not right. It's gonna basically clamp it in there and then you'll be able to snug that up. This thing is, again, handy as a shirt pocket. Next on the list, something you young bucks have no idea about, but when you start getting older, you start losing your eyesight, especially to see small, fine details. That's where this little jewel comes into place. This is a watchmaker's inspection magnifier. It magnifies 20X. Now here's where I use this in the shop, especially when I'm trying to read instructions on something. I can't really see that fine print sometimes. How long is the warranty on that? I ain't got my peepers out here or my spectacles if you're old enough. Ugh. A limited two year. This helps you get down and read that stuff pretty easy. Where I use this the most is if I have a router bit and it has the model number on there, I need to reorder that. I can look through this glass and actually read it where I can't read it just with my plain eyesight. You can also use this to inspect your saw blades to see if a piece of that carbide got chipped when you did hit that piece of metal. Or just in general, do you can see here, this blade is pretty dirty. I need to clean this one. If you combine that with your phone zoom feature, you can zoom in and really get a really magnified look at whatever you're trying to see. If you're trying to inspect a blade, if it's maybe gotten damaged or a bit that maybe got cracked or anything like that, this will help you find that. Also, you can use these to check your router bits to see how dull they are, if you've messed them up, if you hit something. So this is a really little handy tool for less than 10 bucks. You gotta pick it up. You throw this in a toolbox or a drawer or something like that, but basically all you're doing is you can even do like the old timey jewelers. You know, they, they got that stuff they're looking at like this. This is super handy. Next up is this Craig portable crosscut jig. This is a handy little tool if you don't have a crosscut sled or if you've been old schooling it with a, like a speed square to try to get your square cuts. That works as far as fast setup goes, but it leaves a little bit to 
skill and this will help you with that especially if you're a beginner because it gives you a little bit of a, a guide starting out on the cut especially that first part there it helps square that saw up to the stock that you're cutting and then you can make those cuts it even has like a blade set they call it a cut line indicator or something this is kind of gimmicky this little plastic thing that slides out they should have just left that off but as far as cutting cross cut square this will work and it gives you a 45 degree cross cut which is super handy to have this is a nice little jig to have have in the shop especially if you just want to make good square cuts with your circular saw you got to see number five but first let me tell you about this before we move on be sure and check out my website 731bullworks.com store we have easy to follow build plans with step-by-step -step instructions to help you make awesome projects check out our plan bundles where you get more for your money because i've included some of the most popular plans in bundles so that it helps you pick up everything you need to get started and yes, you can build things and sell those projects based off my plans. If you use the code you see on the screen right now, you'll get 20% off any order. All right, go check us out. Number five on the list is a two-in-one countersink and driver bit. I like this because one, it's made in the USA right there in the great state of Montana, and it's a two-in-one. So if you do a lot of countersink, you know how frustrating it is to swap back and forth on bits, especially if you only have one drill. This is super handy because you have the driver bit on one end and then you flip it over and you have the countersink on the other. And they're really good bits. They drill a nice clean hole. And then on the driver bit side, you can swap those out for any quarter inch drive. So if you're using a star drive or anything like that, like this nice little DeWalt set, you can put any star drive or any other flat, Phillips, whatever you're using, and this will adapt to that. The way this two-in-one bit works is similar to an air fitting or a pneumatic fitting. Push forward on this little brass fitting and you can remove the bit flip it over put the other end in and then pull back and that locks it in place you can also again swap those bits out with an allen key the allen key is not necessary to be there because these are magnetic so it'll hold your bits in there magnetically but for a little extra security you can use that allen key make sure your bit doesn't come out and that's very frustrating when it happens so it's nice that they added that they sell this in a set for a little over twenty dollars and it comes with extra drill bits and driver bits that's one i would recommend i'll drop a link in the description to everything you've seen today This is a total game changer if you don't have a track saw or the budget for a high-end track saw and need to make long, straight, accurate cuts. I'm impressed with this one, y'all. Let me show you. I purchased this Miles Craft track saw guide myself with my money. These are my thoughts and my opinions. If you'd like to check them out for yourself, link in the description and the pinned comments. Let's go. First thing you wanna do is put these tracks together and these are two 27 and a half inch tracks, much like the Ryobi track saw. I think that the companies are doing these shorter tracks for shipping and packaging. You can get all that stuff in one small package that way it ships easier. Now, if you wanna cut anything longer than say a four foot cut across a sheet of plywood, so you're gonna cut the length of the plywood, you'll need to pick up an extra pack. However, it's still much cheaper to do that versus buying a track saw. The first thing I noticed when I unbox these is that they include end caps on their tracks. Nobody else is doing that. Festool's not, Milwaukee didn't, Ryobi didn't, Craig didn't. I've yet to see anybody include those track guards on the end. That's pretty awesome because that'll uh, tear your hoses and cords and things like that up. So I'm glad that they included those. So when you connect them, you're just gonna take those two ends that are going together, take those caps off. Now you can certainly just use one of these small tracks if you just wanna cut small parts. In other words, across a tube of six or a tube of eight or anything like that. A lot of people like these shorter tracks. They did include some track connectors that you use to connect these tracks together. They're just gonna slide in those slots. Now there is a little place side to side there. So you're gonna wanna make sure to get these lined up before you tighten them down. I like to use a straight edge. You could use a four foot level, anything like that. That's one of the reasons I like having a precision straight edge in the shop, so just like this. You also wanna make sure you're on a flat surface when you're connecting these up. Perfectly flush there, that's what we wanted. Track lines up perfectly. So far, so good. Now to get this saw trolley, I don't know what they're gonna call this, but this red piece that goes on the track, to get the saw ready to go on there, you wanna get that set on the track. It comes with four cams, basically, that's going to twist and lock that in place. So you wanna tighten those up so that there's no play on there, but it's snug, but not too snug that it's not gonna glide smoothly, just like if you were adjusting a track saw to a track. I like that they did this. As you can see, this saw guy will fit a multitude of different circular saws. Almost all of them should fit on this saw guide. It also comes with a blade spacer. This is gonna make sure that you're setting the blade distance on this track perfectly every time, no matter what saw you're using. And it sets inside this, so you know you're gonna lock it in there. And then you're just gonna set your circular saw up there and lock it in place. These slide to adjust 
you're pressing the blade up against that spacer, it's gonna leave a small, small space there. That way it's accurate when you put it on the track. Now we'll tighten these down and lock it in place. Now you got four clamps that clamp your circular saw into place. It's gonna hold it flat against that plate. In other words, you're gonna be able to get a good 90 degree cut because it's sitting flat on this guide rail. After you get that cinched down on there, it's ready to rock. One thing to consider is battery size. I noticed my four amp hour batteries were rubbing that post on the thumb screw. I will likely trim that off, but two amp hour, three amp hour batteries will fit just fine. Uh, just something to consider. And that post you can't move. So I wish they would have considered that when they made this. Everything can't be perfect. I will say at full depth that these batteries get in the way, but if you're cutting three quarter plywood, anything where you raise your saw up, depending on how the battery attaches to your saw, on this rigid, it is not in the way as you can see. There's plenty of room there to use that four amp hour battery. Now, your, if your saw doesn't have batteries that attach to the back, if it goes to the side, this won't even be an issue for you. Now, just like any other track saw track, you're gonna have to cut the splinter guard to fit or match your saw, which once you cut that, it should match any saw because of the saw blade spacer that they provide because it's putting it in the exact right spot every time. At least that's the theory. Now, one of the main reasons you want a track saw is to cut straight, but also to cut square. That way, if you're cutting thicker woods like this two inch, chunk of walnut we can make sure that we get a good square cut on this and we did get a good square cut with that circular saw using the track so i was actually quite impressed with that uh, at this thickness the quality of your circular saw is going to matter here if you've got a less quality circular saw that flexes a lot on that base then it may cause you some trouble but if you got a good solid circular saw you'll be able to get nice square cuts with that and that full size seven and a quarter circular saw will cut through a two inch block of walnut. So you got plenty of depth there to cut most anything using this Milescraft system. I'm in a sizzle. I'm in a system. The way this rides on the track is fairly interesting to me. I got the battery out so we don't cut our hand off here. But you can see it rides on that single lip that's popped up off of that track. This is a proprietary track, big word for redneck. Or in other words, you can't use your current track saw on this track or use any other items with this track. But you can see that it rides on that, basically a piece of plastic there, and it rides down that lip. That makes sure it stays on track, just like a train riding on the tracks. This, these uh, tension bearings here, you just tighten those up and that keeps it from moving side to side. So you get a nice square cut that doesn't move on you. One thing you can't do is bevel at this current setting because when I start beveling, it just moves everything off. So if you went all the way over and tried to cut riding on that same track, you would absolutely cut that track. It will not cut at a bevel using this circular saw on this track. So this is a 90 degree cut only. For about $100 for this kit with two tracks, this thing is an absolute steal if you don't have a table saw or if you do have a table saw and you just break down a bunch of sheet goods, this is the perfect tool for you if you already have a circular saw. This is one of the best saw guides that I've ever used. And I've used a few of them before with the Craig system. They're plastic, they work pretty good, but this is really solid. Now, this is not perfect and it is absolutely not a replacement for a track saw and I'll tell you why. Number one, a track saw will allow you to bevel no matter what. And this, when you bevel, it will hit that track with this saw. I don't know how other saws will work, but I think that's gonna be a problem for a lot of people if you need to cut 45s or bevels, anything like that. Also, there's no plunge feature like a plunge saw, track saw will plunge easily. This, you could do it, but it would make it a little sketchy and might cause a kickback. And that's another thing you're losing here is there's no anti-kickback anything on here. Another drawback is dust collection. A track saw has much, much better dust collection. Even some of the lower end track saws are better than a circular saw. So you will be giving that up if you pick this over a track saw. During the initial setup process, I said that I really liked how these had the included end caps there. They pop off too easy. In other words, when the saw gets to the end of the track, it'll actually push them off, even though they're flush-ish. It kind of pushes them away and dislodges them. I wish they were tighter in there. There's no way to tighten them up with this, by the way they're made with these little clips. Uh, it's a nicety to have, but it's not well implemented. You'll likely lose those and or chunk them. Like we said earlier, this is a game changer for those who need a solid system to rip down sheet goods. I can't recommend this enough if you have about a hundred bucks to invest in something like this. This is one of the most solid systems I've seen on the market. I am very impressed with this. The tracks go together well. Everything just works. Pretty good job. It's by far not perfect as I stated before, but it is extremely well made and will 
do what you want it to do as far as making straight square cuts. I give this a four out of five fist bumps and I don't give that lightly. I think a lot of you will benefit from picking one of these up if you are in a small shop, you don't have a track saw, you don't have a table saw. This is a good alternative with some limitations. This will change the way you use your table saw for years. It's gonna add a lot of safety and convenience for you and it'll attach to most any table saw, including job site saws, compact table saws, cabinet saws, band saws. You're gonna be able to use this in a variety of ways. Let me show you everything it can do. If you're interested in this fence system, you gotta check it out, link in the description. I highly expect this one to sell out. Let me show you what it can do. This is quite genius actually. If you watch the channel, I made some jigs where I used both feather boards to help attach these vertical feather boards on there to give you that downward pressure. They solved that. This is an extruded aluminum fence and it comes in three sizes, 24, 36 and 46 inches, depending on how long you want the fence to be on your saw. The one that's on here right now, this one is 36 inches. It will give you in-feed and out-feed support, which is huge on a compact table saw, especially if you're in a garage or small shop by yourself or on the work site by yourself. You don't want those boards falling off the back, dangerous reaching over trying to grab those. This is gonna help solve that because of this out-feed support. Now, if you pick the 46 inch version, that's gonna give you that much more distance on the back side, or even if you split it halfway in two, the front and the back giving you that in feed and out feed support. And if you use it on the cabinet saw, you get the same thing. But what I like about it on the cabinet saw is that in feed support, especially if you're trying to cut longer boards by yourself, it can be a little frustrating to try to hold that up there by yourself on sheet goods, things like that. Now this fence is made out of extruded aluminum. It's solid as a rock. When you mount it to your fence, it's only gonna add one inch of thickness. All you have to do is attach this to your fence. It's literally that easy with two clamps. Now you can buy their clamps that fit this, or if you have the micro jig dovetail clamps, they fit this. Some track clamps will fit this, but the Milwaukee track clamp wouldn't. So just be aware of that. But if you have the micro jig or if you wanna pick up theirs, it'll work. Now, the great thing about these is you can position this anywhere you want along the fence. So if you want a more in feed style, you just move the fence towards you. If you want more out feed, then you just move the fence away from you, put those supports on there, and that's gonna give you that out feed or in feed support. And what's awesome about this is this vertical feather board. I love having vertical feather boards on here kind of like just some stock guide roller. It's putting that downward pressure on there. And then when you add the horizontal feather board on there, you're getting the downward and horizontal pressure toward the fence. That's gonna keep your cuts really accurate and quite a bit safer. I really like the fact that you can do this. And I think just looking at this, there's a T-Track on top. I would quite expect there's probably some other attachments that's gonna be made for this. I don't have any inside information, but you can really see what they're doing here. They've set their self up for the long haul on this. So if you get something like this, you're gonna get attachments down the road that's gonna work with this. I like what they've done here. Now this is an awesome attachment for the bandsaw, but before we get to that, let's talk about the table saw. When you use this on the table saw, you're getting three main things in my opinion. Number one, the in-feed out-feed support. I think that's why most people are gonna use this because you're gonna be able to prevent those boards from falling off or give you a little extra support when you're cutting those long boards by yourself. Number two, the vertical feather boards. You can place these before and after the blade, not the horizontal, but the vertical. That's gonna help keep that board from falling off as well. When you make all the way through the cut, it's also gonna keep that board pressed down toward the table, make your cuts more accurate and safe. Number three, this gives you a high fence. If you don't know, if you're trying to make like raised panels or cut grooves in the end of boards, this high fence is a must have for safety. It's gonna keep that board perfectly 90 degrees, got more surface area to hold that board against. You can see here when I'm making these vertical cuts on the end of this big chunk of walnut, everything just glides right through. Nothing moves, it's staying right against the fence, keeps my cuts very accurate and also very safe. Same thing if you're making raised panels or any groove, dado, et cetera, in the end of boards, a high fence is a must have. If you're like me, initially that for this job site saw, the 36 inch fence would be the one for it because it's a little bit wider. It gives a little more extra support here. So I guess it just depends on where you're working and what type of uh, material you're cutting. But I actually think the 46 inch fence is gonna be a better fit for this because I could then use it for in feed and out feed. Just having this 36 inch, if I split in feed and out feed, I'm not getting a whole lot of support here on the backside. However, when you put the 46 inch fence on there, I've got quite a bit of distance here on the back and the front, and I can move this 
if I needed to get extra support, so if I'm cutting really long boards or plywood or something, and I wanted to get that extra long support, now I've got about 26 inches of extra support on the back side of the blade where I need it most when I'm working by myself. I like that. I think the 46 is probably gonna be the pick for most people, even if you have a contractor saw or even the cabinet saw. This is probably the best one to pick. When initially I thought the 36 was going to be the pick for this job site saw. Now, if you're in a tight space, like a really tight space, and you don't think you'll use that extra support, then the 36 will work just fine. But also be cautious about tightening this down too much on your aluminum fence. If you have something like the saw stop fence or one of those T-glide fences, you'll probably not have any issues, but this is aluminum, so you don't wanna over tighten. It's not gonna take much. You're just gonna snug that up, and then this will be plenty secure for anything that you're gonna be doing with it. Just don't bend the fence on your contractor or job site saw. Another thing I was worried about was if this would remain square like my other fence, and it does. There's no issues there. It is square all the way down without any issues at all. So that's good. I think if you're in a small shop or using a small saw like this without an outfeed table, this fence will be a game changer because what happens when you push that stock all the way through the blade on the backside without an outfeed table? It's happened to me hundreds of times with my old Delta saw before I had an official outfeed table. Outfeed tables take up a lot of room. If you're limited on space, this is really gonna help. Because I've got feather boards on here, because I've got outfeed support in a couple of different places with this 46 inch, that piece is not gonna fall off of there. If it was really wide, it would probably, or wider, it would probably fall off of there. But for smaller stock, it's gonna support it really well, especially on the cut piece. You don't have to worry about trying to reach over that blade and catch those pieces falling. The outfeed pieces will catch that. Now the only caution to this is if your table saw isn't mounted or bolted down somehow, you're putting a whole lot of extra weight on the back side of the saw, especially if you're cutting thicker wood, you're gonna counter lever that basically. All you gotta do is cut a two before to length. There is a spot underneath both of these out feed or in feed, however you wanna use them, that fits a two before perfectly. And once you put that in there, you're just gonna drive a screw through the top just to hold it nice and secure. And they even have this countersunk so that screw's not gonna get in the way of your wood that comes through there. Now you have an extra leg on the back that'll basically keep this from tipping and causing you any trouble. I got a big old thick piece of wall nut. It's about two inches, a little shy, two inches thick. It's really heavy, but I want to show you how well this supports just uh, a big fat, for instance, because I don't want to cut it because I don't want to waste it. Same principle applies, pushing all the way through. It still gives it plenty of support on the back. It supports it after the cut or behind the blade just fine. I think that was a good idea of them to put that support option on there. What makes this bow fence unique is this ability to add on these accessories like their feather boards that they make. I love these feather boards. These are the only ones I use. This foam won't mar the wood and it keeps a good pressure down or sideways depending on which way you're using them. But they fit right in this T groove on this fence. And so you can literally add one of these before and after the blade, only the verticals after the blade. These on the horizontal plane, don't put one behind the blade because it'll cause pinching. It always goes before the blade. But these right here will help keep pressure down, especially on these long cuts, especially on sheet goods, things like that. It's gonna keep it pushing toward the fence and down toward the table. It's gonna give you much more accurate cuts. And I love the fact that you can add these on there now. Another thing I like about this fence is how fast it is to put on and off. It's literally two clamps. Unscrew them, pick it up off there. Take this and just set it anywhere, hang it, put it in your shop somewhere. Uh, clamp it to something with those clamps uh, to keep it up out of the way, but it's really easy to take on and off. Now, if you have a bandsaw, you will absolutely love having one of these for your bandsaw. It's gonna do a few things as well. Number one, you still get those vertical feather boards, so if you're cutting longer, thinner stock, keeps that pressure vertically down. You can pair this with some horizontal feather boards or the horizontal blade that the Bow Products has that keeps it pressed against the fence. When you're resawing boards, this thing shines for resawing. Gives you the high fence, so when you're resawing those wide boards, a lot of support there, as well as that horizontal pressure, so you get those accurate resaws. This thing shines there. Again, this will fit any table saw, no matter which one you got, including Harvey or Unisaws, because it has a groove designed to fit those saws, or clamps to fit on any other saw. One concern people may have is when you put this on there, will it damage the top of your table saw, scuff it up, mar it? No, because they do have these plastic standoffs on there that will keep it up off the surface just a little bit. That's gonna keep sawdust from piling up against the fence or causing any inaccuracies there. But the main point is to prevent any damage to your table saw top. So they really thought of everything here. If you have a smaller contractor or job site style saw, this literally gives you uh, basically the table size or even bigger 
than a cabinet saw with that in feed and out feed support. I do think, I know we YouTubers throw this around a lot. This is a game changer for a lot of people for their saws and for the price point this is at, I don't think you'll ever spend better money upgrading your table saw. And what's great about this is it is a modular system. What that means is you can buy the fence separately from all of these pieces. So if you already have some like these feather boards, there's no need to rebuy those. If you have like the micro jig clamps, no need to be able to rebuy those or get charged for those. So you can buy the fence, the feather boards, the outfeed, whatever you need. You can literally purchase say the 24 inch fence for your bandsaw, the 46 or 36 for your table saw and use the same attachments on both of them. I like that. I'm highly impressed with this bow fence system. It's very nice. They did send me these to review. No money changed hands and I'm not keeping these. These will be given away to some of our two before nation, but it's impressive. I'm gonna buy one for the saw just because of how awesome it is. I bought five fake tools that are made very similar to the Woodpecker's brand. And I wanna know, will they measure up? Get it, measure up. Let's find out. Before we jump into this, let me know in the comments below, do you think the price difference is gonna be worth it for the Woodpecker's line? Let's go. One of my favorite Woodpecker's tools is the Poloni Pocket Rule. I've had the Poloni Pocket Rule six inch for a long time, and I just went ahead and bought this set because I use them all the time. I love this tool. Now, this is a woodworking ruler, as you can see right there. How similar are these? Man, they are strikingly similar. Let's find out which ones measure up. First off, these dupes come in a nice foam packaging. It's gonna protect them in the package. I'll put a link to all of these tools that you're gonna to see today in the description and the pinned comment to help you find them easier if you wanna check them out for yourself. Straight out of the box, the Amazon versions, you can tell that the slide rule part of this is quite different. Obviously, the woodpeckers made in the USA, these made in China. If that matters to you, then then obviously the pick will be made in the USA version. On the Poloni pocket rule, you have inches on one side, millimeters on the other. Same thing on the reverse side. However, on the Amazon version, you've got inches on one side and then the other side has both inches and millimeters. The hardware for the Poloni pocket rule is much nicer than say the Amazon version. A little shinier, just looks better in my opinion. Also the anodized aluminum is a little heavier here versus the Poloni pocket rule. Not a lot of difference, but it's probably the bigger slide. The Amazon version on top is slightly thicker than the woodpeckers on the bottom, which probably also adds to that weight. Not probably, it does. The woodpecker version is exactly 0.125 or 1 8th of an inch thick, so you can use actually use that blade thickness for various things, so setting up things or measuring, etc. Whereas the Amazon version is slightly over that at one or at 0.155. One feature I've always liked about the Poloni pocket rule is the fact that you can stand it on edge just by removing the slide and putting it inside this slot. And this works great if you just want to use that end scale there, which on one side is inches. On the other side, again, millimeters. The Amazon version does virtually the same thing. You can remove the slide, put it in there, and it'll stand on edge. You've got inches on one side and then millimeters on the other. One thing I've always appreciated about woodpeckers is their attention to accuracy. As you can see, I've got the Amazon version just kind of lining them up so they all at the start at the same spot. And all the way across, doesn't matter which one of them, they all line up perfectly. Six inches is six inches there, or six inches on the third one. And then you can always take this all the way out to the final eight inches or millimeters if you're looking at 200, 210. They're all exactly the same all the way across. Now, will the Amazon version do the same? Let's line up the Amazon version and see if it's the same. We're gonna use the Poloni pocket rule as our edge. Then we're gonna go across here. These two are virtually the same all the way through six inches. However, out here at eight inches, you can see this one is slightly longer by just a fraction. I mean, it's very, very minor, but if that matters to you, that's, I think that's where you're gonna start seeing a little differences here. They're not exactly the same as the Woodpecker's brand, and it is so minor, it's just, just a half of a half of a millimeter or something like that. Another thing you should be able to use these for is a square. When you tighten these two thumb screws down, everything should square up, so we're gonna check that now. This is the Poloni pocket rule, and then just to the side of that, we'll put P on this side, just to the side of that will be the Amazon version. On the Amazon, perfectly square. On the Poloni, perfectly square. So no difference there. Round one, I think the Amazon ones are a very good value for what you're getting if you want some pocket rules like this. And that's coming from a Woodpeckers fan. 
These are pretty nice. Now, would I buy these normally if I'm looking at pocket rules? I'm still probably going to go with the woodpeckers made in the USA. Also, you know, the eighth inch thickness there, I use that sometimes to set things up and they do have a hole for hanging if that matters to you. But for the most part, if you're on a budget and you want some really good pocket rules, check these out and they're not bad. Now the pricing difference in the Poloni pocket rule versus the Amazon brand, which is a, called Violet Fox Woodworking Rulers. The Poloni pocket rule set cost me $159.99 for the set. That's from Amazon. Now the Violet Fox was $28.99. That is a giant difference in price in those two and not a lot of difference in quality in my opinion as far as what you're getting. Now, you also go back to the USA made versus China made, you figure that out on your own. I love having a T-square in the shop. I've had a 24 inch T-square for a long time, but these things are crazy expensive for what they are. They are extremely nice. They have some really cool features of it, but I found one on Amazon that's very close to the Woodpecker's brand for much less. Let's see if it measures up. When I got this 12 inch Woodpecker T-square in, it comes just like this, pre-assembled, ready to roll, perfectly square. However, the Amazon version, some assembly required. <laughs> I don't like that. I would much prefer them to assemble this at the factory. I'm assuming they did this for the shipping reasons. Took less than a minute to put that together. First thing I noticed on these two is the fact that the, the length of the blade is much thinner than the woodpeckers and the shoulder part is also much, much shorter. They assemble basically the same way, but again, this comes from the factory. One good thing about this is the fact that it'll only go on one way so you can't reverse it. So if you try to put it on the other way, you can't get it wrong. Both of those have the shoulders on there, which I really like that that is included on the Amazon version. I use these all the time, especially when laying out sheet goods. Because of that shoulder, it rests right there. So if it didn't have that, it would have a tendency to tip. But with both of these having those shoulders, those are on there. Check and accuracy, we use the Poloni pocket rule. We'll line up, make sure the one inch mark is lined perfectly. And then we'll run it all the way out to 12 and see how well they line up. Again, perfect match on the woodpecker. Do the same thing on the Amazon version. We've got lined up the one inch all the way across to 12. Are we accurate? Dead on. Now, are they square? Because that's really all that matters on a T square. So we're gonna measure these the same way as we did the previous. One observation right here is the fact that this part of the T square on the woodpeckers is perfectly flush with the material that you're marking where this one is slightly elevated so you can't mark past it. I think the Woodpeckers is nicer than that area. That Amazon version, perfectly square. Woodpeckers version, perfectly square. Now T-squares are great little layout tools, especially like these both have those center marks down through there or center holes so that you can drop your pencil in. And say you want to describe a three and a half inch parallel line, these are super easy to do that with. These are probably some of the better setup tools for this application versus some of the other ones because of how wide this shoulder is that everything glides and just you get an accurate mark every time. Three and a half and three and a half. We'll see if there's any difference. One thing that may be hard to show on camera is these holes are slightly bigger than these. Now the opening to these looks to be the same, but these are also tapered down so that your pencil leg kind of finds center. I think that's gonna really matter if you're wanting precision and accuracy, you'll go with the Woodpecker's version here. If you're not doing that and you just want a T-square, this may be a good option for you. It's not bad for the price. Now the T-square, there's a big price difference here too. Almost double the price for the Woodpecker brand. I paid $153.99, I've lost my mind, for the Woodpecker's 12 inch T-square. Now you could get that a little cheaper on Woodpecker's, but shipping, etc. you figure that out. Now the Amazon brand was only $59.97. You are losing a few little minor features there that I actually preferred on the Woodpecker's. If budget's not a concern, then the Woodpecker's brand is the one I would go for, the one I like. I just prefer it over the other, but the other one's still super square, super nice. If you like this type of content, be sure to click that subscribe button, click the bell icon so you get notified of all the new content I've got coming. Next up is the Saddle T Square. One thing I love about the Saddle T is the fact that you can mark two sides of the board and have that line carry all the way over. The pre-drilled holes in a Saddle T Square also help you draw those parallel, or scribe, draw, scribe, I say draw, y'all may say scribe. You draw those parallel lines on your work and you can get very precise with this if you so choose. Now the made in China version of the Saddle T looks like this. 
It's so close, y'all. Like. This is a direct ripoff, in my opinion. There's some slight differences in the two saddle tees, but even the way they've printed their logo and stuff on there is very, very similar. Now, what you will notice is this piece is thicker on the woodpeckers, and this piece is a little thinner. That won't matter at all as far as marking and measuring go. They're both shaped exactly alike, uh, in my opinion. Like, they look almost identical as far as side to side and how they uh, look. Now, this one is slightly wider. The Amazon version is so ever so slightly wider. The font is different. Again, on this font, it's a little bit more bold, less crisp to me. And one thing that stands out immediately, the measurements on the Amazon version is off. And the reason I know that is you can slightly see a difference there. See how it's a little, the Amazon version is slightly inset. This one is exactly correct, the woodpecker's line. And it's that way on both sides. This side less so. You can see it's slightly less so, but it's still there. Now, one thing you may notice right here is where this really shines. If you're working with three quarter stock, this saddle tee goes all the way to the bottom. This is three quarters of an inch thick, where this is not. And so when you're marking, you see that line tail off. That's where you try to make a mark down and it tails off because it won't go all the way to the bottom. The reason you're buying the saddle tee is for, for precision work. And you can see the holes are much, much finer than on the Amazon version, the woodpecker's version, smaller holes. So you're gonna get thinner lines. And then of course, also the three quarter inch as we discussed. Now the Woodpecker Saddle T-Square is only $79.99, only $79.99. The one I bought from Amazon was $49.97. So only just a little bit of difference there. I would actually highly recommend going with the Woodpecker's brand here because of the minor differences that will make a big difference down the road. Number four on the list is the mini square. These are handy as a shirt pocket, y'all. I'm telling you, if you get one of these in the shop, you'll always be looking in your shirt pocket for it because this thing is really nice to have for just checking small, small pieces like small boxes, small drawers, ends of chisels, and tons of other little small square items. This is the way the Woodpecker's mini square comes. This is the way the Amazon version comes. Woodpecker sent it in a nice little MDF holder if you want to put that somewhere. Amazon version comes in bubble wrap. Straight out of the box, they look identical. They're also both square to each other, so I'm assuming they're both square. They're the same thicknesses, they're the same lengths, even the slots are the same. The chamfer around the slots look the same. Like this thing looks identical to the Woodpecker's version, identical. There are some slight differences in the thicknesses of them using my caliper, but the very, very minor difference. Not a lot of price difference here either. I paid $47.99 for the tiny square from Woodpeckers from Amazon, and the Amazon version is only $11.99, and there's almost no difference. So if you want a tiny square, $11.99 is the one I would actually recommend. Again, USA, China made, up to you. Number five on the list is the Mini Carpenter Square, also known as the Delve Square. Again, hand is a shirt pocket to have in the shop. I love this little square. One of my favorites, one I reach for all the time at this workbench. Now this is a not an exact knockoff, obviously, but it is very similar to another square I have, which I'll show just a minute. They did paint it red. You get a, they even included a pencil with extra lead. A pen and a nice little foam holder if you wanted to drop that in a toolbox to keep everything sorted. Now the Dell Square versus the Amazon version, small square they call it, uh, you'll see some similarities and quite a bit of differences. These holes back here are different obviously and then also some different markings, different hole patterns, etc. So these aren't an exact replica but it is basically the same square with different features. Now, the Dell Square is one of those that's often duplicated but never exactly replicated. Never duplicated. It has some unique features that other squares just don't have. First and foremost, that hole right there is self-centering on three-quarter inch stock, especially like cabinet frames, things like that. You can use a self-centering drill bit there. It's going to drill exactly in the center of your frame. So I brought my DFM square in because I thought these were the exact same thing. They are not. The DFM square is extremely handy. I love this square. On the face, they look identical. They are very similar. But when you turn it over, you notice that the blade is centered on the DFM square. It's offset on the version from Amazon. So that offset makes it just like the Delve square. This is the Amazon version. That offset, the offset on one side lets you mark center of a three quarter inch piece perfectly every time. Same thing with the Woodpecker's Delve square. The shorter offset allows you to lay out mortise and tenon on three quarter inch stock. 
the Dell Square the same thing. Then they both have those holes for parallel scribe lines. Where these two differ from the Delft Square is the fact that they have those pre-drilled holes at those degrees. So if you needed to, say, lay out a 60 degree angle, you drop that included pin in there, and then all you have to do is slide that up and down and you've got 60 degrees. You could do 45, but obviously the 45 is there as well. And then you've got 30, 22 and a half, however you need to lay those out. These are good for octagons and hexagons, things like that. You'll notice that the blades are the same thickness on these two. These two are very, very similar to each other or similar to the DF version, if you don't mind the offset blade. You'll also notice that the Dell Square and the Amazon version are exactly square to each other. So there's no issues there. The Dell Square is $94.99 and the Amazon version is only $34.99. And the DFM version is only $44 and change. So I would actually steer you toward the DFM version if you're inclined for a small square and you don't need the offset blade for the mortise and tenon layout or the center a finder on three quarter inch stock. If not, then it's gonna come down to the USA versus China made again on the Dell Square versus the Amazon version. I'm obviously a Woodpeckers fan and one thing you can't discount is the warranty on their tools. Lifetime warranties free from defects. So if anything goes wrong with it or it's defective, then they're gonna fix it for you. I can't say that about the ones you pick up on Amazon or anywhere else. So that comes into play too, as far as if you plan on having these tools for a lifetime in your shop. The right drill bit can make or break a woodworking project. First on the list are multi-use twist bits or angle bits. A lot of different names for them, but they come in packages like this. Or a lot of us still have these metal boxes around that I know my dad and grandpa both had sets of these. They must have sold them really cheap at Sears and Roebuck or wherever they bought them at. But a lot of us have these metal boxes like this. These type drill bits have their place in woodworking on some level uh, we use them for a multitude of reasons a lot of mine uses are for pilot holes so that i can just drill a quick pilot hole at the end of a board to prevent that splitting uh, if you're driving screws in there now the ends of these bits are just angled and so when you try to drill a hole or pinpoint a specific spot sometimes these bits have a tendency to walk around it's always good to use a center punch or a spring-loaded punch like i have here to set the mark where you want to start the drill that'll help that bit stay in that spot while you drill. You can see here when I use the center punch, it come out almost perfectly in the center of those two lines. Whereas when I use the non-center punch, it had a tendency to walk around a little bit. And then I was able to drill the hole, but it is off the mark. These do have a tendency to tear out a little bit on the backside, especially on the bigger size bits. That's one of the drawbacks of those angle bits like that. But the, again, they do have their place in the woodworking shop and everybody should have a set. I recommend this DeWalt set. You get a, uh, all the way from 1 16th all the way up to half inch. And you also get three extras of some of those smaller sizes because those tend to break when you hold the drill wrong, drilling pilot holes, things like that. So that's a nice add on, especially in this nice little case that keeps them organized so long as you put them back. Next on the list are Brad Point bits. These are some essential bits in the shop. They have a couple of unique features that no other bit has. I picked up this set of Owl Tools Brad Point drill bit set. It's a 12 pack. It's a really good value for all the size bits you get. Brad Point bits have two unique features. One is the point, the Brad Point, kind of like a Brad nail, right? What that allows you to do is pinpoint with accuracy, hitting the exact spot where you want to drill. And that bit actually, or the point actually sticks in there. And when you drill that hole, you don't have to worry about it walking on you like the angle point bits do. You'll also notice on the Brad point bit, the shoulders here behind the tip slope back toward that tip slightly. And what that allows it to do is actually cut the wood as it's going through. It's also gonna drill a smoother hole on the inside versus the angle point bit. Let me drill a hole with both and I'll show you. Brad point bits are excellent for drilling a specific spot or just drilling like a small hole to, so you can put a dowel in and cap over a screw head, something like that. Just a really good option to have in the shop. If you're interested in any of the drill bits I show today, there'll be links in the description below to each one. Third on the list is by far my favorite drill bit to use in the shop, and those are Forstner bits. A Forstner bit is basically a round or a bigger round bit than your standard bits. They have the Brad point bit on there. 
They also have almost kind of like blades in the center that actually cut the wood and you'll see the shavings actually coming off of the wood as you drill, giving you a clean edge as well as a flat bottom. Way back in 2017 when I built my dog kennel, I was looking for a drill bit that I could drill clean holes for those bars to sit in. That's when I discovered Forstner bits. I knew that I needed those, so I ordered one the right size for the rebar to go in and from then I was hooked. I went on to use them in my stove covers where I drilled two holes and then connected them with a jigsaw to create a handle. You can also use forcer bits to drill angled holes where it's very hard to do that with other type bits. And you could also drill at the edge of boards as well as connecting them together to make oblong holes or to just to hog out material for uh, your mortises. I have this nice set of Irwin Forstner bits that I bought about $50-ish or so. It's a pretty good set. I do see that they start to dull after several uses, especially if they start heating up. But they are a very good option for beginners or those on a budget. I've recently invested in a set of Fish Wave Forstner bits. Now these are very expensive compared to the Irwin bits but you're getting what you paid for, in my opinion. Now these fish wave bits on the outer rim of them, you'll see this kind of a wavy serrated design that really makes a very smooth cut where you'll see the Irwin brand has the kind of a sawtooth design, which more tears through the wood. It's still cutting it, but it's cutting it kind of like a saw blade where the fish wave bits are almost slicing the wood fibers. What that wavy design does is create less friction and less friction is gonna create less heat buildup. And heat is the enemy of sharp blades. The, the lower the temperature you can keep your bits and blades, the longer they're gonna stay sharp and the longer they're gonna last you. Fish bits can also be resharpened up to 30 times. So that's a kind of a long life bit for you. That's one of the reasons I love these fish bits. When you're using Forstner bits or any larger bit, the lower speed actually helps the bit out. The higher the speed, you're gonna create more heat and just create more work for the bit. So just remember the larger the bit, the lower the speed on drill presses especially. On the fish side, you see that this is very smooth all the way around on the inside. There's a tiny bit of fraying right there, nothing major, uh, a little bit of sandpaper that's gone. This side, there is a little bit of tear out all the way around the edge or in a couple of different places on the edge. And the inside is quite a bit rougher than on the fish side. So these, because of the design of this sawtooth design, it, it's cutting a little bit rougher and the bottom is also rougher. So these fish bits cut much smoother than other types. One of the best ways to prevent tear out with a Forstner bit is to drill until the point of that bit goes through the other side and then drill in from the other side like this. The tip just comes through, switch sides. There you go. I'll say this, I've been woodworking for a long time and I've used several different bits. If you have the budget, get the wave bits. They'll last you likely a lifetime or very close to it. If you're on a budget, get this Irwin set. These are really great bits for what you're getting for the price. I'll also say Freud bits have the wavy edge and they're very good as well. Forstner bits and drill presses work beautifully together. They're almost made for each other, like Oreos and milk, peas and carrots, woodworkers and sawdust. Like you. They work together well. If you have a drill press, you want a good set of Forstner bits. This is a wind drill press. I've got a review on the channel way back a few years ago. This has served me well for a budget beginner drill press. I really recommend this one. Who likes peas and carrots anyway? Number four on the list are the Wood Owl Overdrive bits. Now these are very unique in a couple of different ways. They're basically a brad point bit, but they have these extremely long flutes on there to clear away that material much faster. Wood Owl claims that these will give you 35% more battery life uh, using these bits versus other bits because these were specifically designed for cordless drill. These are made from high carbon steel and they will actually work in an impact driver. They have this standard quarter inch driver bit on one end, so you can use them in a drill or impact, which is very cool. The unique design of these has almost like the Brad Point and similar to a Forstner bit on the edges here where it's actually cutting that wood instead of basically tearing it. What's impressive about these wood out overdrive bits is they actually do what they say. There's minimal tear out. Now you'll get some here and there, but nothing like you do with a Forstner bit, a regular drill bit, or Brad Point bits or anything like that. So if you want to get higher chances on a cleaner hole, if you have to go all the way through, the wood out overdrive bits are the way to go. You play around with the drill settings and the type of material you're drilling into, you'll get much better results once you figure out does it work better on slower speeds or higher speeds depending on the bit size and material you're using. I've tested these against Forstner bits, I've tested these against regular drill bits, and these outperform both of those if you're drilling a through hole. I really like these wood owl bits. Number five on the list, and don't forget to stick around for the one you should avoid, 
Number five are countersink bits, and I'm gonna throw self-centering drill bits in this mix because they're both not the same, but in the same group, I think. Anyway, what do you think? Self-centering drill bits are made for centering in a hole, especially for hinges. If you try to take a drill bit and hit the exact center of the hole on a hinge, you're likely gonna be off one way or the other, and that's gonna throw your cabinets off when the screw pulls the hinge wrong. So these self-centering drill bits will center that hole perfectly, and then you can drive your screw home without worrying about it. Now countersink bits are essential for woodworking. There's tons of different reasons why you want the head of that screw below the surface, and there's a couple of different styles. I picked up this Wood Owl set of uh, countersink bits. I also picked up this Irwin set of countersink bits, and what these are for is if there's already a hole there, or you've drilled a hole and you now you need to countersink that, that screw head, these are great for that, and these will work on metal as well. So a double, double purpose on these. Now the way the countersink bits work are they have uh, the drill bit that drills the pilot hole, but they also have this extra bit up here that actually cuts a, basically a beveled edge around the, where the screw head can set in. There's also another countersink bit that has a stop on it that prevents you from plunging too far so that all of your countersink holes are, are very uniform. These work extremely well, except some versions or some models will mar the wood. So you have to kind of be careful about the ones you buy. I would steer clear of the very, very cheap ones and spend a little money and protect your project. A bonus drill bit that I think every woodworker should have in the shop are hole saw kits or a hole saw. You don't need them a lot, but sometimes you need those big holes drilled, specifically like on when I was making my cornhole boards. I needed to have a big six inch hole there, so I went and ordered a six inch bit. Well, over time, I've noticed that uh, here or there, I needed to drill a hole that was bigger than my Forstner bit. So I went ahead and picked up a set of Milwaukee hole saw. These aren't specifically needed by woodworkers, but they are extremely handy to have when you need them. So do you need them? Now, one bit that's quite popular that I think most woodworkers doing woodworking should avoid in most cases are spade bits. Spade bits are specifically made for the construction industry where they're drilling holes through uh, studs and things to run piping and wires, things like that. They drill a pretty nasty, messy hole most of the time, but that's what they're for. They're for speed to auger out that material quickly so that they can run those wires and pipes fast. There are uses here and there for them in the wood shop, but for fine woodworking or if you're building projects that you want that hole to look nice and clean, you should really use the Forstner bit and not the spade bit. Number one on the list is the SawSet Pro. This thing is awesome if you do any type of miter cuts anytime. This is a great little tool to have. It looks like the old school protractors we used to use way back when I was in grade school, but it has unique features on it that makes setting your saw up for the cut super easy. On one side of the SawSet Pro, you'll see that it says single, and on the opposite side, you'll see that it shows double miter, and there's a reason for that. Let me show you. All you need to use this is a T-bevel and the SawSet Pro. If I needed to know what that angle was, I needed to cut for both pieces. In other words, a double miter. We're gonna use the double miter side. We're gonna take our T-bevel. It says place T-bevel here. So you're gonna set that on the bottom of the T-bevel or on the bottom of the saw set. And you're gonna move this over until it touches that piece right there that actually sticks up. That's basically a catch to tell you where to stop at. That's showing us a 10 degree angle to set the saw. From there, we're gonna move the saw over to the 10 degree angle, lock it down. A perfectly matched miter corner, simple as that. Check that out. It'll also easily find single angles. When I was building this miter station, I almost, or I thought about putting angle drawer faces on here so that it, it stayed flush instead of being inset. I actually preferred the inset look, so I went this way. But if I had wanted to put that angle on there, then each side of those drawer faces would have needed to be angled. How to find that angle easily, simple as this. You'll take your T-bevel, Line it up on this outside edge as well as on that inside edge, that's our angle. Gonna be using the single side of the saw set Pro. It says place T-bevel here, in other words, on the bottom. Looking at about a 22 and a half degree angle. So if I use a square piece and put it at, at that angle, you see that it would just, it would look kind of funky right there on that edge. However, when I cut that 22 and a half degree angle, if I put that drawer face on, then you can see that it would look really nice and finished. This thing takes quick work out of trying to figure out angles and math, and it's just a super simple tool that works extremely well. And it's from a small family owned business out of Canada. So if you ever deal with angles at any time, one of these would be handy to have in the toolbox. If you do a lot more trim work, 
There's a few instructional videos on SawSet's website that you can check out for yourself. I'll link their site down below. Number two on the list is clamps, and not just any clamp, a very unique one that I find very useful, under $30. These are two different F-style clamps from Bessie. This is a traditional one. This is the new gear-driven model, and I, I just love the way they work because they are a space saver. To adjust the clamping, you actually twist this handle that's on the bar itself. So that saves this little bit of space here, and that's what's great about these. Let me show you. If you watched me build this miter station, I had to cut a T-track in the top so that I would have a stop block system. I used a board as a straight edge to guide my router so that I could cut a good straight line. These style clamps wouldn't work because they won't fit under here without contacting the surface below. They also would be in the way if you turn them up this way. However, these clamps, because of their unique design, I was able to slide that right in there, clamp my bore down tight, then I could cut that groove with the router. I call these new, but they've been out for a couple years. They act like regular clamps as far as how they slide up and down. They come in various sizes, even the 24 inch, this is a 12, even the 24 inch is under $30, I'll link to both. Let me show you something else they can do real quick. These have 450 pounds of clamping pressure, so that's more than enough than you'll ever need for most clamping applications. What's great about the space saving design is if you've ever used a traditional style clamp to clamp down something flat against a surface, you know how difficult it can be to actually get your hand there to twist this to get a good clamping pressure on that. With the gear drive, you don't have that problem so long as this is tall enough. If it's too short or too thin a material, but inch and a half, inch to anything over about an inch, you can get a good clamp on. Plenty of room to manipulate the clamp mechanism back here without having to interfere with the table. Just super cool tool. If you work in tight spaces, or you may at some point, these will come in handy. I recommend picking up a couple. Before I tell you about the number three tool that's under $30, let me tell you about our bill plans, which are also under $30. If you go check out our online store, 731woodworks.com slash store, you'll see that we have various different build plans available to help you make awesome projects. We've also bundled some of those plans together to help you save even more. At checkout, if you use the code AWESOME, I'll give you 20% more off anything you buy. Go check it out. If you have a work table that has T-tracks, they can be invaluable to actually hold things down while you're working on them, like sanding, routing, many other different things that you can you need stuff to stay still while you're working on it i have a couple of different styles here but these don't work as good as these let me show you you can see the blue ones have an arch to them very similar to the gray but the blue ones use a washer washer to pivot over that slotted hole whereas the masca brand basically i don't know what you call that it's like a pivot point and it allows you to get different angles and keep that pressure on the clamp. If you don't have T-Tracks on your work surface, they're super easy to install with a three quarter inch bit. I use T-Track clamps all the time. If I was needing to work on the end of this board or to sand this board or whatever I needed for it to be still and not move on me, you can use these in either direction. So if you need a little more reach, you can use the long side. If you need to be a little more clamping pressure straight down, you use the shorter side. Typically I use a couple, that way it's held in two different places. Once I get it snug, I can work on this board and it's not gonna move unless I want it to. Like I can really wrench down and pull it, but as far as normal working, you're not gonna need to do that. I mean, it's just gonna be rock solid. Where I found the benefit of these is because of the way they're made, this keeps that even clamping pressure down with that half circle piece that goes into that groove on taller stock that you need to hold. This is where this really shines because a normal one won't fit as good as this. Let me show you that. While these still work, you can see how the pressure of the, the clamp is on the front of that washer pushing down. It just doesn't hold as solid. You can also use these on the CNC to hold down your work. Although I would be very cautious because these bolts do stick up. So you wanna make sure you're not gonna hit that when your CNC is moving and they're aluminum. So make sure they're well away from the cut area. These come in two packs for under 30 bucks and it's just a good value all around. Next on the list is a wood glue hack trick. Something you need for your wood glue. I've used the glue bot for years and while it's a decent product, I wouldn't call it great. Uh, one main issue is I always lose the little rubber cap thing and this tip stops up consistently. All the way down in here, I wind up digging it out. I actually wind up cutting the end of it and then it just becomes useless and it's just, there's glue in there and I never use it. Simple, very cheap fix. Thanks to All Red Woodworking for coming up with this tip. So why condiment bottles? So this is like K2 
ketchup and mustard bottles. Glue doesn't stick to plastic, so you're not gonna have to worry about that. It comes out nice and easy. There's no getting stuck on there and all that stuff. And even if it dried right at the tip, all you have to do is take a little something and pop in there and then just, you're good to go again. I like how easy the glue flows out of here. You can do real thick beads. You can do thinner beads if you want. Like just however much pressure you're putting on there, you can flood an area and it's just less mess than the other way. I will say this about the glue bot. The only reason I keep it around and deal with the frustration of this tip always clogging up is for vertical gluing. In other words, when I was putting the trim or the face trim on this miter station and things like that, I can hold the bottle upright and squeeze it. The glue, the way when you squeeze it comes from the bottom and out the spout so you can glue like this. For any other normal applications, I'll be grabbing my glue ketchup bottle. Last but certainly not least, I've heard so much about this stuff, I'm almost tired of hearing about it. But I had to pick up this 3M extract paper that everybody's talking about how amazing it is. It's less than $30 a pack for 50 disc in any grit that you're looking at. Or you can pick up a sample pack like this that has 12 pieces of paper in there with varying grits. Let's see if it lives up to the hype. I've been buying this Festool granite paper and while it works really well, it's really expensive. This is much less expensive, so if it works even better, that's gonna be a positive in my book. I need some more 120 grit. I also needed some 220 and I got some 320. As you can see, it's you can see through it because it's that mesh. So it'll still pull the air through there. If you got a dust extractor, it'll, it'll match any of the sanders you may have. I'm glad they printed on the back what the grid is, that way you don't get them confused. This little sorter box that I have here, very inexpensive. I'll also link that in the description below. That way it keeps everything organized. I can keep my sanding pads, different grits, everything just in its own separate place. So the way this works, it'll stick to most any of your hook and loop sanding pads that should already be on your sander. Backing is kind of fuzzy feeling, so almost like a hook and loop. We're gonna try it out on this tube six. That's pretty impressive. Like that was less than the 60 seconds probably. I've been messing around with epoxy, making some epoxy cutting boards or serving trays, things like that. Also have these little hammers I made and they have quite a bit of epoxy sticking off the back. And one problem with epoxy is it clogs up sandpaper really fast. Let's see what it does with this. You can see where that epoxy dust was, it's gone because it got sucked up in there when I just hit it with that board. Or you can use something like this sanding eraser. These are very inexpensive too and it'll prolong the life of your sandpaper. Even the feel of the grit, like you can still feel it. A lot of times when you're using regular sandpaper, it gets clogged up. The old pencil test on some quilted maple, try that out. Same sheet of sandpaper we've been using. Now I'm gonna do the other half with the granite 120. So I actually ruined this piece trying to sand that tab off. It's just not made for that. You should have just cut that and then sand because it took all the grit off of it. But that's a little extreme application. Put a new piece on there and it's right through it. Because it is hook and loop, it'll work on your sanding mouses as well. I use these all the time. I actually featured this in a previous video, but. I think this stuff comes in three inch, five inch, six inch, uh, even bigger than that. But for the most of us, the five or the six is all you're gonna need. That five inch Festool paper, I was paying like 35 or $40 for a 50 pack. This is less than $30, around $20 when I bought this per 50 pack. It's quite a bit of savings, especially on something you're just using up pretty quickly. So I like the 3M cost and I like the performance. I'm switching. Number one on the list, every woodworker's favorite item is a clamp, but not just any clamp. This clamp has a very specific purpose because it has that band right there. Let me show you. So a few weeks back, I made a desk on this channel where I actually used these band clamps to hold on some trim while it dried. These are perfect if you don't want any type of hardware showing where you've attached something. In other words, you're just gonna glue an edge trim piece on. These will hold that on there super secure. The grip on these, so the pads where these grip are super strong, so they're not gonna slip off. The band that's used on there is a good strong rubber. It doesn't give really easily. 
but it also doesn't, it's not too stiff that it's not gonna flex a little bit. You want that to be just right so when you actually clamp something on there, it's holding pressure against the piece you're clamping it to, and that way that glue dries and gives a nice tight seam. I want you to see how much uh, grip these things have. I can press in on that and put quite a bit of pressure. I can stretch it all the way to the end because it's gripped here and it's pushing pressure that way. One thing to note on the construction of them, it is a metal spring inside there and the outside is a nice thick plastic. And then these are actually really grippy, these pads here. And then this rubber band that goes in there, you can see where it locks in there. It's not gonna pop out and it has a lot of good strength on it. Another great thing are these self-adjusting jaws. So even if you go really wide and have to clamp something, these will adjust and fit parallel. And in case you're wondering, this is just a piece of paper that you can just easily take off. There's other uses for these as well. You can just use them to hold something temporarily in place like a regular clamp. You can also use them to hold up electrical cords so you don't always trip over them. You can actually get four of these for less than $30. That's a huge deal. You're gonna find yourself using them all the time. Comment below, let me know what your favorite tool under $30 is. If I pick your tool for the next video, I'll give you a shout out. Next on the list is the FastCat Track Rack. And these are super convenient to have if you have a track saw or tracks for your router, whatever you need it to hang. These are specifically made to fit the tracks of most track saws. It'll fit the wind track saw, it'll fit the Festool, it'll also fit the Craig, and I'm quite sure it'll fit the Makita, although I don't have a Makita track. On the garage door is where I chose to mount mine. It comes with mounting hardware to actually screw into studs if you wanted to hang them onto the wall however you want to do that. I chose to put mine on the garage door because this is a place that I wasn't using for anything else. And these tracks and these little racks add very, very little weight. And so it's not going to affect the garage door at all. Basically the way these work is you have a little groove that the track actually sets down in to hold the bottom of it in place. And then at the top, there's a little cam that you just twist and it locks that track in. It's not going to go anywhere. You can raise the garage door up. And it's not going to affect it. It's just going to hang there. There's nothing there to come loose. The installation in the garage door was really easy because it came with these sheet metal screws, self-tapping, self-drilling screws. Went right in there, no problem. Just be sure you don't screw through the garage door. Mine had these tubing style braces that go up the length of the door, so I didn't have any issues to worry about there. I've actually had this in here for probably two months now. The, the previous video you just saw of this, I actually recorded a little while back and I had Craig tracks in there. I had. Uh, wind tracks that was using there, they work extremely well and they've held up well. That's what I was kind of waiting on. I made the video of me installing them, how they work, and then I wanted to wait and see how they held up because they are plastic. And while they are plastic, I can highly recommend these. The only issue I have, it's issue, the only issue I have is when I raise the garage door, my tracks are up there. But I don't do that often because I'm blessed enough to have climate control in here. I highly recommend these if you need to store tracks out of the way. It also includes these little feet if you wanted to store them vertically instead of horizontally like me. You could just attach these and that would catch the bottom of the track. At the time I purchased them, they were like $27. They fluctuate $27 to $29, $30. It's ever great once while I go over $31, so just be aware of that. But they should be under $30 99% of the time. One of my favorite new tools I've gotten in the shop recently is a benchmark double square. Not just the six inch, but also the four inch. Both of these are under 30, just depends on what size you want. I'll show you both. They're exactly the same, one small, one's not. A double square is extremely useful in the wood shop because you can square either way. It doesn't matter which way you turn it, you're gonna be able to use it. You can use it to set depths of bits and blades and all sorts of things. You can also use it to draw square lines and that's one thing it has to be is square and both of these are perfectly square. In my mind, the woodpeckers is one of the gold standards as far as accuracy goes. So I always compare everything in the shop to the woodpeckers tools that I have in here. And as you can see, they're both perfectly square. It's not something to sneeze at because a lot of these lesser expensive type squares like this that slide, a lot of times there's too much play in there and they'll actually be out of square, but both of these are perfectly square. Not only that, but the rule is exactly accurate as well. You see, I line up that benchmark rule at the one inch mark and it is perfectly aligned all the way down and there's no deviation in there. I mean, it's, a, it's perfectly accurate. I checked this one as well. It's the exact same thing. It is also accurate. And you can take these apart and use this as a rule. So you could just have basically have two tools in one. Easily goes back together as well.
One thing I like about this benchmark double square is on this side, there's 60 fourths of an inch. There's also 30 seconds of an inch. If you flip it over, you get the standard eighths and sixteenths, which most of us use, but every now and then you do want that extra little bit of uh, accuracy to dial stuff in. And the smaller four inch is the same way. 30 seconds, 64th, eighths and sixteenths. This blade of the rule is made out of tempered metal. It's not gonna rust on you. It's just a good quality tool. It's a good thick rule, so it's not flexing, it's not bending. This is gonna hold up and last you a very long time. All of this is metal. This piece is metal. The screw piece that holds, it tightens and loosens is metal. It slides easily. Just a high quality tool for a low price. Do you have dreams and goals? I know I do. And one of those goals is to reach 500,000 subscribers by the end of this year. I wrote it on this goal board last year in a video and I need your help with that. We're getting close to 300,000 right now at the time of this video. If you'll hit that subscribe button, that'll be one more closer and I would greatly appreciate it. One of the best things you can have in the shop is an accurate rule. You'll use it all the time and they're not that expensive, especially this one. Let me show you. If you watch the channel, you know I like my rules. Poloni pocket rules. I've got slide rules. I've got all kinds. The layout and measuring, the only thing that matters, honestly, is accuracy. And these are dead accurate every time, every one of their products. This rule is made in the USA. It's Incra and it's stainless steel. So it's not gonna rust. It's gonna last a very long time. This goes down to 30 seconds. It also has 16th markings all the way across. And if you'll notice, it has holes in it. Can you see that? Those are for your pencil. Unfortunately, my Pika pencil that I love so much won't actually work most of the time in those holes. It'll fit, but you have to get a really sharp lead. So I just picked up this old generic mechanical pencil. So if I was needing to lay something out, you can see every one of those dots right there is a hole. There's a mark there so you can get a pencil lead in there to make a mark. Every one of those slots is also a hole so you can make marks. So if I need to lay out accurate lines that need to be dead accurate every single time, we can use this to mark it one inch, three inch, five inch, anywhere you want. You can just use those slots to make those marks. I've got tick marks all the way across there. Now I can take a square and square those up and I know I've got accurate measurements. One thing I do wish is if it was marked on the back side as well, it's not, but it is has tons of markings on the front. Truthfully, I was a little bit worried about how thin this thing was that it would get damaged or I would break it or something. I've had it for several weeks now and I've used it quite a bit and it's held up well. Like the markings are holding up well. I actually like how thin it is because you can get your pencil right next to it and you're making the mark exactly where you need it. Not a whole lot to say about this little thing. It's just awesome. Go get one. I'm telling you, you'll love it. We started this list with clamps and we got to end it with clamps because I got some really awesome ones to show you. Actually, if you'll notice the workbench is now dirty and a few minutes ago it wasn't on the video. What happened was I did a video on something else that was under $30 and then I got to making some charcuterie boards and started using these clamps. And I was like, these things are too good not to share. I'm a fan of Bessie clamps. I love their parallel clamps, but when it comes to F style clamps, I have found no others better than Jorgensen. And that's really saying something because these are extremely affordable and they're just awesome. You see this Bessie clamp here, this is a 12 inch clamp, same size. The bar thinner, the handle thinner, it's just a lighter weight and they're about the equal price. This Jorgensen brand, not only is it a sweet color orange, but it has a very nice grip on here. This thing is really nice and thick. The older I get, the, the harder it is to grip things and get your hands on these smaller things and actually get some torque on there. Especially when you're putting on things like calls or you just need that extra clamping pressure. This really helps because the bigger diameter gives you a little bit more torque. The quality of this handle, even comparing it to the Bessie parallel clamp, which is a much more expensive clamp, you can see that this has a nice handle on it. It really does. This one, in my opinion, is even better than that. I mean, it's just a, it's just high quality. It feels quality. With most all F-style clamps, these pieces right here come off so easily. Uh, you'll likely lose those. You can also take these pieces off that cover this bottom part of the clamp if you wish. On the top part, I've taken some Plasti Dip. I made a video on how to do that. Really simple, and that actually gets the rubber coating on the top of your F-clamps. And I always get asked what type of wood this is. This is leopard wood and purple heart, curly maple, walnut. This is a Harbor Freight brand clamp and I've used these a few times or several times actually over the years. And the thing that gets me on these is they bend super easy. You can see this thing is really bent. Every time I go to tighten something down, this bends and I hardly ever use these unless I'm just running out of clamps. This is thick enough that it's not gonna bend, not easily. I mean, you would have to 
I don't know if you could put enough pressure on the clamp to make that bend. It's a really thick, robust clamp. There's not a whole lot I can tell you about an F clamp. Most people have them. They work well for various applications. And these are some of the best I've used. Highly recommended from me. Number one on the list is the Craig Multipurpose Project Blocks. If you've seen the channel before, you know I've used these Rockler Bench Cookies a bunch and their work supports. And these are very similar, but with an added bonus. Let me show you. The great thing about these is they come in a four pack. And if you've ever worked on anything, you know you need four to support it properly. And the great thing about these are very similar to a bench cookie. They have this rubber grip built into the top and the bottom, so you can actually turn them either way. It doesn't really matter. And when you put your stock on there, if you're sanding that, or if you're laying out something, whatever you need to do with that, it's gonna be secure and sturdy and not slip. If you've seen me use these Rockler Bench Cookies before, you've probably seen me use these finish cones that snap on top. That's just another added buy to buy for these. They work well, but that's just something else to keep up with. What's great about the Craig brand, this has an integrated paint cone. All you have to do is press this little push button on the side and it raises right up. Now you got a built-in paint cone that you can use to support your stock, especially when you're using clear finishes. Let me pop them all up, I'll show you. If I put a clear finish on the one side of this and I didn't want to damage that finish, that's what these little points are for. You just set it down on there and now I can put finish on the top while also protecting the finish on the bottom. One thing I really like about the Craig blocks with the paint tip is that's rubber on top or some type of rubber plastic, something that's similar to the grippy material. The problem with these is they're plastic, they're hard plastic, so when you actually put your workpiece on there, if you press down, it can actually put a, a detent or some type of little divot into your workpiece, especially on softwoods. This shouldn't do that because it has a softer material. It doesn't give, in other words, it's not squishy, but it's just less, it's less likely to mar, scuff, or scratch. Number two on the list, Carter Products Fast System. It's a fence alignment system tool. These things are great for lining your fence to your bandsaw blade, or you can use them at the table saw or the router, router table. Let me show you. I'll show you how to use these on the table saw and the router, but I wanna show you the bandsaw first because that's what they're specifically made for. You can see on the back here, they have a cutout or a dado in there. And they also have magnets that are inset. And the magnet is so that it sticks to the blade. The dado or the cutout is so that the teeth have a place to basically go into because you know a bandsaw's teeth basically exaggerated looks like that. So if we didn't have that cutout, then the teeth would throw off the square. Now if you have a bandsaw, you know this thing gets knocked out of square quite often. And if it is out of square, that's one great thing about these blocks. When you move that fence over, you're gonna see it pretty obvious right there that we have some adjusting to do. And that's what's great about those blocks. Now I can just basically use the adjustment on the bandsaw fence to get everything nice and square again. Just a little more. And then I can tighten that down. Look at there, we've got a very fast setup, extremely fast. I was able to square that blade up with that fence at a half inch, now I can cut. We've got half, three eighths, quarter, three sixteenths, and a one eighth inch block. Of course, if you wanted to stack a half and say a quarter, we're gonna get a three quarter inch block that we'll be able to set three quarters of an inch. Because these have that magnet on the back, you can see I can easily store them on the bandsaw, either up top or more likely down here on the bottom, just for vibrations purposes. They'll stay there. They're not gonna come off of there. So it's just a great place to store them and they'll always be handy right here at the bandsaw. Let's see what else they can do. If you've watched the, this series of videos, you know I am a sucker for setup blocks. I love them because they make your life so much easier and faster. You can use these on the table saw. This is the half inch. You're just gonna move it over next to the blade. Lower your blade and then just by sight and feel, you can set these up. to get that perfect half inch height to cut those dados, those grooves, whatever you need to do. And like we did on the bandsaw, you can actually set these on top of each other and they will snap together because of those magnets are pulling them together. And just like at the table saw, we can use them at the router table or on a fixed base router is the same way, but you're just gonna lower it down and go by sight and feel. And then now we can cut a half inch dado using that bit there. So 
multiple purposes. Number three on the list, stick around for four and five because you're gonna love those. This is probably my favorite new tool in the shop. I say that every time I get a new tool, but it is. I, I love Woodpecker's tools and I'm a huge fan of those. I highly recommend at least the 1282 SS out of these two that I'll show you because it's the bigger of the two, but it's super handy to have a smaller square. So if it's in your budget, I would recommend just getting both. These squares have some very unique features that I've never seen on any other square. And that's one thing I love about Woodpecker's is their attention to detail and their features that are actually useful. I've had this carpenter square for a very long time and up until this point, this has been the square of choice to make sure things were square. And what I found was this ain't square. It, it's gonna be really hard to see on camera, I think, but I'll show you a little closer up view. If you see that gap right there, this is perfectly pushed up against the workbench. This piece is perfectly pushed down against this square. And I've got a gap right there and it's touching up here. That means it's out of square, something is. Uh, this one is not, this one is, let me show you. Take your square, put it on a flat surface like this and then make a mark. You got a mark and we're gonna flip that over. We're gonna come to the exact same spot right there. We're gonna make another mark. You can see that line is straight. When we do the framing square, we're gonna put it just beside it. I can already see it out of square there. There's two lines there and they both start out at the same spot. Woodpecker's line, frame and square line. You can see that there is an obvious out of square issue with that square. In woodworking, that is a real problem. It is, it can cause some pretty major issues if you're building boxes, furniture, now, really anything in woodworking, it needs to be square. And that's one thing I love about woodpeckers is they're guaranteed to be square and everything I've ever got from them has been precise. This also has a lot of other features I wanna show you real quick. These squares are essentially the same. We just got a big brother and a little brother. The blade's gonna be thinner obviously than that. But for the most part, the features are exactly the same. It has the end scale up to an inch and a quarter. Uh, this is just a smaller version of that. This blade is stainless steel. It's actually one piece, although it doesn't look like it. It actually is one piece in there. And then these two pieces of red anodized aluminum clamp over the top of it. And the SS stands for stainless steel. Why that one piece matters is because it's cut out with a CNC. That means it's gonna be square every time on every square they make. A few of the features that I absolutely love about these squares, and I've just find them a joy to use. I like that it has that cutout right there that when I set this on the workpiece, I can actually draw the line from edge to edge and it covers the whole piece. I also like that it has these marks that are indented that I can set my pencil in and make a scribe at any one of these marks all the way up to probably 11 and a half inches. And by far my favorite feature of this square is the fact that this blade is sticking out further than this anodized aluminum and it will sit on top of your workpiece keeping this flat. Last but certainly not least, and one of the favorite and the reason I keep going back to Woodpecker's tools is their accuracy. We've got a, the 642, the 1282, the edge rule, the pocket rule, and the indexable square. And when you line them all up, every one of their measuring marks lines up exactly the same all the way across the line of tools. They're just so accurate, absolutely worth what they paid for them. They could probably charge more and I would buy that too. They're just that good. If you're still using the miter gauge that come with your saw, this is a saw stop. It's a really expensive saw and they give a crap <laughs> miter gauge. Uh, just to put it bluntly, this thing is hot garbage and they should be ashamed for even putting it in the box. Uh, that, that's how I feel about this. However, for a very minimal investment, probably less than $100, give or take, the Incra Miter V27 is a fantastic upgrade to a crap miter gauge. And what's great about this is it'll fit almost any T-Track slot on most any table saw and it has an adjustable miter gauge or miter bar with this little included wrench. And the way that works is when you screw down these tightening screws, it expands that plastic and it makes it to where it has zero play in it left or right. It just, it will not move, but it will still slide smoothly in your slot. You can see this miter gauge, it has a little bit of play. You really can't see it, but you can hear it. It just has too much play. There's really no way to adjust it other than that screw down here. And that's only on that end. Also, this thing has 
uh, almost a sixteenth of play, fully locked down. It'll move left or right, which means out of square, locked in on zero. It's, it's no good. You can't use it for any accurate uses. For 75 ish dollars, sometimes less, a very inexpensive upgrade for a miter gauge for your saw. This thing is fantastic. And you can go from 60 degrees to 60 degrees either way. It's very simple to actually operate that, loosen this thumb screw, remove this detent lock, and then just turn your miter gauge and then push that back in. And what you'll see is when you push this back in, even if you're, say, slightly off, when you get it, I'm trying to get it close. When you get it close and you push that back in, it locks it in. It, it basically, because that's a needle point, that's a needle point, it locks it in. Then you can just tighten that screw down and you've got a 60 degree miter that you're able to make at the table saw. Easily move it back to zero, lock it back in place, and then tighten that down. Everything's tight. That's gonna be a nice, perfect square cut to your blade. As square as a square can be square just a perfectly square cut. That's just a, just dead on 45 degrees. I, I haven't touched it. I literally took it out of the box and put that knob on it. That's it. It also works on your miter saw or your band saw, just like it does on the table saw that goes into that track and operates exactly the same way. It's just a great way to add a miter gauge to your bandsaw if you don't have one. You can also attach a false fence or a temporary fence on here if you needed a longer cross cuts. You would just attach that through these slotted holes here. And the reason you see these bolts on there is to actually adjust square this away. So you could just unloosen these and tighten and loosen as you needed until your fence was perfectly square with your table saw top. I mean, it's, it's just a beautiful tool. I mean, it's so accurate has this nice skid resistant bottom so it doesn't scuff up your table. Just all around awesome. Last but certainly not least, my favorite push block that I've bought to date. Not to be confused with the gripper ripper. I like this one and I showed it on a, a video not too long ago for making thin cuts and different things on the table saw. This is a push block that has a very unique feature that I absolutely love and I'm using it all the time now, especially on the jointer, sometimes on the router table and the table saw, but mostly I use it on the jointer. If you saw the video where I recommended the Bench Dog push blocks, I still love these. I still use these all the time. I like the surface area. I like the big grip. However, this one has these tabs that come down and they are so useful you would not believe it. If you use the jointer a lot, you know when you're pushing the stock through with regular push blocks like this, they work most of the time, but there are times when it just, you get down on this end and you start losing a little bit of grip. Because these are automatic too, they just automatically fall in and up so you can set it on the top and use it like a regular push block. But if you push it to the back, this actually catches, it'll catch the edge of that board. And when you're pushing it through, it basically gives you another point of contact to help you push through the, the joint or the cut. Absolutely awesome. And these are, by far the most useful push blocks I've got. If for whatever reason you don't want these automatically coming down, all you have to do is just put a little bit of pressure on them and they'll actually snap back up in place and they'll stay up in the up position and they won't be in your way. Actually, they've never gotten in my way being automatic. So as you can see, I just got this other one in because I love this thing so much. I went ahead and ordered another one for this specific purpose on the bandsaw. So the reason I specifically wanted two of these was so if I could resaw on the bandsaw. You don't always use the fence when you're cutting. You can actually just follow this line I have on there. That's what I'm gonna do now, but this will allow me, uh, the unique feature of that flat piece that's on one side allows these to stand up on their own. And of course these hooks back here will keep my fingers from even getting close to the blade at any point. So let's do it. These add like extra safety to that bandsaw because I am very nervous about my hand or fingers getting close to that very sharp and very dangerous blade. I don't want any nips or tucks or anything like that with that blade. And this will keep my hands away from that for that specific purpose. It, that is well worth the price of these. Uh, by far my favorite push block today.
Number one on the list is from a YouTuber you probably all know, Izzy Swan. He came up with an end feed table and it's genius. Let me show you. If you try to cut wide panels on your crosscut sled or a jointing jig or anything like that, you'll notice that when you bring the crosscut sled back, it tilts down and you have to support it back here. Well, easy solved that. Now this actually works on a variety of different saws, not just this saw stop. And I'll put a link in the description below to all the saws that it, it works on that Izzy explains. A couple of great features about this is it has a miter slot. So your sleds and things like that are gonna line right up with your existing miter slot. It has this angle with the rubberized cork on there. And then it has the clamp to hold it tight. All you gotta do is line up your miter slot and then clamp it down. Everything comes with this too. You get the clamp, you get the angle iron and you get the screws, everything. So now when I cut these wide parts, I've got support back here. I don't even have to hold it. It's gonna hold this up and I don't have to worry about it falling anymore. I got plenty of room to get my blade up higher if I needed to and then make this cut every time and have this support here. I am excited to have this in the shop. This is one of those things that when you get it or you see it, you're like, yes, I need it. Another great thing about this in feed table is I can use it with my jointing and tapering jig. A lot of times you're jointing or tapering longer boards and this thing, it doesn't have a miter slot. So I just move this over a little bit, move my fence wherever I need it, which is right there on the edge of this. This gives me a lot of support on the in feed side, allows me to joint and taper longer boards here. This thing is absolutely a necessity if you use jigs like this or using this with your existing miter gauge to cut wider panels. It's impossible without something like this end feed table. That's gonna give you extra room back here to support your miter gauge. It runs in that miter slot, just like you see here. It's just a really good idea. And even without using this with jigs or anything like that, it's gonna give you some extra support on those longer cuts, big sheet goods or long boards you're ripping down. This just gives you that added support. Another 14 inches behind the saw to help hold things up while you make that cut. It's made with high quality plywood it also has a laminate top, so it's got that nice finish on it. It literally installs in seconds. And because Izzy has oversized this miter slot slightly, you don't even have to worry about getting it perfectly lined up with yours. Just get it really close and then clamp it down. And the clamp is adjustable, so you can create more or less pressure on that clamp. Another great thing about this is it's compact, so it's not gonna take up a bunch of space in your shop. And once you're done with it, you can just put it away easily in a drawer, hang it on the wall, whatever you need to do. Now I purchased this myself. Izzy as far as I know, doesn't know me. I've never spoke to him, but this is just a really, really good idea. And Izzy's done a ton for the maker community. He's invented some really cool things on his channel. So go check this one out. Number two on the list is a small carpenter square from DFM Toolworks, another small business making tools right here in the USA. You may be familiar with the Woodpecker's Delve Square. This is a very popular square. It's really cool and it's been surprising how much I've actually reached and grabbed this in the shop working day to day. The DFM square is the same size at three and three quarter by three and a half and super handy. It's actually got a few more features on it that the Delft square doesn't have and at half the price. One thing is that because of the size of it, it's three and a half inches, you could just easily mark across a two before. And should you need to continue the line around the board, you can just use the shoulder up there and you've got a perfect spot to continue on. The Dell Square has holes every eighth inch for scribing while the DFM Square actually has them every 16th of an inch. So you get much more precision here using the DFM Square. This little square also comes with this pin that drops in any of these holes. You'll see it's marked 22 and a half up to 67 and a half. That's gonna give you a positive stop. Drop it in the 45, it's gonna give you a positive stop there and back here at the pivot point. Then all you have to do is make your mark wherever you need to, and you don't have to worry about holding it in line. Like with this one, you have to hold it on the 45 degree, move it, hold it on the 45 degree. This just really speeds up the process. This square is a square, so you can use it to square up your blades. You could also use the scale on the side to set blade heights and bit heights at the router table or the router. It's just a multifunction little tool, and it's small enough it can either fit in your pocket or in the pocket of an apron if you wear one of those. And the bottom blade is exactly one quarter of an inch thick, and this blade is exactly one eighth inch thick. So you have those two as well as you can use to set things up with. These also come in multiple colors, blue, green, orange, and black and metric and imperial version. So lots of options for you. I don't think you can go wrong with either of these squares. I like them both a lot, but this one is half the price of this one. I like to hang mine on the tool wall. I've been leaving that one right here at the miter station. Number three on the list is the Micro Jig Fit Finder. This thing is super handy and super easy to use. It'll speed up tons of your processes. If you're cutting half laps, finding the center of stock, 
Tons of other things, let me show you. Finding the center of a dowel, like if you're gonna drill a hole or if you just need to put it on the lathe, something like that has never been easier. All you have to do is slide the round stock under P2 and then you'll use P3 as a gauge to mark the center. You just hold it on the top and then mark a line using the bottom as a reference. Turn it 90 degrees, do the same thing, and then you have a perfectly centered mark. If you cut a lot of half laps, this thing is just gonna change your life. <laughs> it's to make it so much easier. Uh, one, it has magnets in the bottom, so on a cast iron top like a table saw, it'll stick right to it and help hold everything down. I got these two pieces. I wanna know exactly what half is, and I need to set the blade like that. So all we have to do is raise this up, stick this under P2 and tighten it down. Now that is exactly half of the stock. Once you got your blade height set, just get your miter gauge out so you can hold it square and then make your cuts up until whatever width you want. Here I went two inches because my pieces were two inches wide and they, when you put them together, they fit together perfectly. There was no trying to measure or trying to figure out anything. It was just using this little jig and it comes out awesome. If you wanted to rip this piece in half, you can use the jig to do the same thing. You're gonna set it under there, set it, and then just take it over to your fence. Once you have it set with the fence, then you can rip that piece in half if you so chose. Not only are they awesome on the table saw, but you can use them on the bandsaw as well as at the router table to set the height of those bits to the exact half distance of anything you want to cut. It's one of those tools that when you get it in the shop, you're like, I saved so much time. Check them out. Number four on the list, these are hand screw clamps or Jorgensen clamps, some people call them. You see these in a lot of the old timer shop. And I always thought they were old timers clamps until I started studying these. They have a ton of uses that we can use all over the shop. Let me show you. For a quick stop block at the router table, these things are awesome. All you have to do is just put them on there, tighten them up, and you've got a stop block anywhere you want along your fence. Also, you can use these to hold small parts when you're drilling. That's one of the most uncomfortable feelings is trying to drill a small part, hoping that bit don't catch and rip your finger, or worse, pull your finger into a bit, especially a Forstner bit. These will help hold that, and you don't have to worry about it. Another great use is you can use these to hold up panels while you get everything set up to assemble. They're perfect for that. Or at the workbench to set up a temporary vertical vise. Just use another clamp to clamp it to the workbench and then you've got this as a vertical vise. And because these have two independent screws, you can loosen and tighten them independently, which means you can clamp things at different angles with these. So useful to have and very inexpensive. You gotta have at least two Maybe four of these in the shop of different sizes. Last but absolutely not least, I think every woodworker should have one of these in their shop. It's a precision straight edge. This is just a, a machine piece of aluminum, but you can absolutely ensure that it's perfectly straight and flat. With that, you can check the edge of boards just to make sure everything you just jointed is perfect or if you just cut it on the table saw. You can also use this when you're setting up your table saw to make sure those side tables are all perfectly flat. Use it at the jointer to make sure both beds are coplanar or if you're building a miter station, anything like that, you can ensure that the miter saw is exactly flat or parallel with the out feed table and in feed table on there. Of course, marking straight lines, things like that. This is such an inexpensive, necessary tool to have in the shop. And the way this is made out of aluminum, it's got a nice design on it. It's easy to hold and you'll use it all the time in the shop and these don't take up much space and you can store these about anywhere. These come in a variety of sizes. I picked up the 38 inch version, but you can get one a little longer, a little shorter, whichever one you prefer. And just a note, I purchased all the tools you saw in this video myself. Number one on the list, this is the Inkra Tiny T. This is one of the coolest little rules you'll ever see. Almost made a wrap. This little tiny T is about four inches long, give or take. This will slide along this little piece of T track. If you did want to remove it from the track, it's really easy to do so. And these are just bolted on, so you can actually unscrew those. And if you just wanted to use this as a layout tool without the, this piece, you can certainly do that. One thing I'd like to point out is this T-Track has a ledge on the left side that actually uh, makes this blade will contact the back and that's gonna keep everything nice and square. If you don't put it on that way, if you put it on backwards and tighten it down, it's actually gonna bend your blade because it has to come over that little, that little notch there. So be sure to put it in correctly, just like this. If you're gonna use this like as a square or marking device, from where it makes contact with the wood out to the ends about three and seven eighths inches long, the outside edge all the way to the end is four and a half inches. And the reason I use my measuring tape is because it only goes out to three inches. It leaves space for this end rule, which is very handy for something I'll show you in a minute. The blade of the Tiny T rule is stainless steel, so you're not gonna have to worry about it rusting. 
It has various scales on here that you can actually put your pencil in to make the mark. On this line is 30 seconds. On this line is 1 16th. And then the 30 second again. There's actually 1 64th marks across here so you can get really, really precise. And then also 30 seconds up here. As a matter of fact, on the 64th, you can see it actually goes 1 64th, 2 64th, 3 64th. So you can really dial in any precision you need. And on the end, you also have 30 seconds of an inch for your end scale from zero to two inches. You can draw parallel lines using those marks that are pre-cut into the rule. You just drop your pencil on the line and then you can draw that line. I've shown several setup blocks before, but because this has this little tiny piece of T-track on there, you can actually set this up upright. It'll stand on its own, even though it is really thin. And you can actually use that to set the depth of your saw blades. Another great feature is you can actually use it on your router table to set the depth of your router bits. You can also use it on fixed base routers to set the depth of the bit on these. I really like the cutout windows you can see through and actually set the depth of the router bit by looking and seeing where it's at through the scale. This is a really, really affordable precision woodworking tool you should pick up and put it in your toolbox. One of the coolest additions to my shop has been the Shapeco 4 XXL from Carbide 3D, the sponsor of today's video. I love having my Shapeco in the shop because I've been able to create some awesome stuff. I've been able to make these custom router tray inserts, these wrench holders, catch-all trays, mallets, and so much more. I also use the CNC to batch out mallet templates for our online store as well as some other products we sell. Having a CNC in the shop has allowed us to bring in extra income because it's like having another employee in the shop cutting parts while I'm doing something else. That's why it's such a great investment because it can pay for itself extremely quickly with the products you can make with it. It's easy to get started with Shapeco. They have great customer service and free software available to help you run your machine. What's awesome about Carbide 3D machines is everything is included, like the work holding, the dust collection attachments, the hybrid table, software, training, and support should you need it. If you're interested in learning more about Shapeco or you wanna get one for yourself, there's a link in the description below to carbide3d.com. Go check them out. This is a Pika pencil. What is a Pika pencil? Pika actually has a line of drawing or marking instruments for us woodworkers, and they work really well. And not only that, they got some really cool features. Let me show you. If you're anything like me, you've been buying bags of these little mechanical pencils, but the maddening thing about these is you'll be marking and the, just like that, the pencil lead breaks so easy on these things. This is actually a 0.7, so it's actually even a thicker lead than the 0.5. The Pico Pencil has a lot of features and the lead doesn't break like that. Let me show you. One of my favorite features, if you have an apron, then you can obviously put this in the apron. You can put this in there. This little clip actually has some little teeth that kind of grab on to your pants. So they're not gonna go anywhere. And you can actually pull the pencil out, use it, and then put it back and it's going to be there. It's kind of silly. That's one of my favorite things because it makes it so convenient to have on you. So this is the Pika Dry. It's just a pencil and you can see the lead. You think it, it's kind of a thicker lead up near the pencil itself, but it comes to a point. It actually has a sharpener built into this carry case as you can see there. All you do is stick that thing in there and rotate it and you have a sharp pencil. It's super easy and it's very convenient they built that in to the holder. And this, like any other mechanical pencil, all you do is push the button down to extend the lead. If you're using regular pencils to mark on maple or pine or anything like that, you can see that they make a mark and you can actually see them. When you're working with purple heart or walnut, sometimes it can be hard to see those marks, especially on the darker woods. The Pika, pop that off, you can take the lead out don't dump yours on the floor like I did. Has refills, you can get it in red or yellow or regular graphite color. Let's go with yellow. It marks on purple heart, super clear. You'll be able to see that all day long and then on walnut all day long. Pika has other products as well like this deep hole marker. The nib on it on the shaft is, is much deeper than the regular standard pencil. So if you needed to get down into the bottom of a hole and make a mark, you could do that with this. If you pick up a pick a pencil, pick a pick a pick a pell of pickle pencils. If you pick up a pick a pencil, also pick up one of these multi-use packs that has the yellow, the red, and the refills in there for standard lead. Next on the list is a Woodpecker Saddle T6. This is basically a few tools in one. This is essentially a T-square, but it's also a rule, but it's also 
uh, kind of like a pocket rule. Now there's a few reasons why I chose to show you the Saddle T6 in the same video with the Incra Mini. This edge and this edge are exactly the same. So they're coplanar. You can actually mark that and mark that. That is the same line. I can't tell you how many times using a traditional square that I would mark and then have to flip the board over and try to eyeball it. This takes care of that. I like that part. This is also a perfect 90 degree angle this away. So we know that when I put that on there, this is actually going to be square, a square line to this edge every time. The way the Saddle T6 is designed, you can see that it kind of falls off or is beveled toward the bottom. I really like that about a lot of the woodpecker's tools like on the T-Rule and on this, that way you get that line right next to the piece you're actually gonna mark and you don't wind up mismarking because of the thickness of the blade. These holes are in 30 seconds inch of an increment if you get the imperial scale from zero to six inches. The actual length, total length that you can measure on this is six and three quarters. You can just drop your pencil into say the two inch mark if you wanted to draw a two inch line and drag or scribe it there. You can do three inches, whatever you're doing there, but it's gonna make them perfectly parallel to the edge that you're working off of. I've said this several times on any of the woodpecker's tools I've shown. One of the main things that I really appreciate about the woodpecker's line is the fact that every single thing they make is exactly the same as far as measurements go. If I line all of these up at zero, every mark all the way down through there is exactly the same from zero all the way through six inches. Or if I had a 24 inch one of these and a 24 inch T-square, they would be exactly the same from start to finish. You can't say that on most tools. Also, this is a pretty thick piece of aluminum. You're not gonna bend it under normal use. You can actually even stick it in your pocket if you so chose, or your apron pocket or whatever you, however you carry it around. But it's very durable, you're not gonna you ain't gonna hurt it under normal use. Now, I know they're not for everybody, but if you appreciate accuracy, you appreciate quality, and you appreciate American made, then the Woodpecker's line is a really good tool line. Next on the list is the gripper. I'm sure you've seen this around YouTube a bunch. This is one of those tools that a lot of people have, and there's a good reason for it. They're just excellent tools to have in the shop, especially for the table saw. Let me show you. I've used a variety of push sticks on a variety of projects. Some troll commented the other day that, ah, you're busted, I see the gripper, and you're not even using it. I don't use it for everything. I only use it for specific purposes. If I have a cut to make like this, this is a very thin cut, and I have to get right up next to the blade, especially if it's to where a push stick like this will not go past the blade without hitting the blade. I could use one like this, but I don't like my hands being that close to an exposed blade. That's why I love the gripper. I can cut that thin stock without having to actually worry about my hand being on that blade or near the blade. And if I needed to use it on thicker pieces, you can adjust this piece down, which is what makes the gripper really nice because it puts that little foot down, gives you a little more balance or a little more stability there when you're making those type cuts on thicker stock or thinner stock. It doesn't really matter, it'll adjust to all of them. The knobs, everything on this is really high quality feeling. You're not gonna feel like you got a cheap push stick that's unsafe. You're when you feel it and you use it, you're gonna know that you got a good piece of equipment in the shop. Now, if you're like me, you've probably seen one of these floating around for years and you never have picked one up. I'm telling you, when you get to ripping those little thin pieces like that over the top of that blade with that little push stick, you know how uneasy that feels. This takes that uneasiness all away from you. Here you can see where I'm trying to use a hole saw, which is traditionally what you would drill a hole with on wood. You can see it's actually smoking because it's dull and they just don't work good. And it's actually sawing the wood versus if you used a Forstner bit, you can see the wood chips come flying out. It's actually cutting the wood. That's what I like about the Forstner bit. The holes are gonna be much smoother when you drill with the Forstner bit versus when you drill with a hole saw. You're, also, you're gonna get a cleaner cut. You can also drill at a certain depth and stop and have that wood and all that extra removed versus a hole saw you can't do that with. If you needed to inset a coin like I have in the past or dowels, anything like that, you can just drill to whatever depth you want and stop. And because of the way a Forstner bit is made, if I had a specific spot I wanted to drill into, it has that point on there, much like a Brad point bit. That's gonna give you a good starting place so that it's not gonna move on you, so you'll be able to kind of sink that in and then start drilling from there. 
and the way they have these teeth on there, and that's why you get these shavings like this, because actually cutting the wood with this blade, those teeth help get a good start. It doesn't tear the wood out like on a hole saw. And Forstner bits are actually perfect for a drill press. This is where I use them the most. Go ahead and grab you a good set of Forstner bits. I guarantee you're gonna come back and thank me when you need that specific size you wouldn't have otherwise had. Number one on the list is the Bridge City Toolworks UG1 Universal Gauge. This is probably one of the most multi-use tools you can have in your shop for layout. Let me show you. The UG1 can be a tri-square, it can be a protractor, it can be a depth gauge, it can be a height gauge, it can be a marking gauge, it can be a centering rule, it can be a flip standoff. It has a magnetic base. There's just tons and tons of ways to use this and I'm gonna show you most of them. First and foremost is the packaging. Look at this, this is from Bridge City and their next level packaging. It has a sleeve over the box and then when you open the box, it's just really well made. And these tools are held in with a foam. If you wanted to keep the bottom of the box and use this as storage, it'd be a great way to store these safely. Now these come in right and left versions and there's a reason why. For the most part, one of them is for a right tilt saw. So like a table saw that tilts to the right. And the other one's for the left tilt saw. I would recommend picking up both no matter what tilt saw you have. But if you're only gonna get one, just pick the type saw you have, left or right tilt, and go with that gauge. One thing to note on the left and right versions, this is the left version, this is the right version. If you have a left tilt saw, you need the right version because the right version tilts to the left. And also this left version tilts to the right. So whichever version saw you have, pick the opposite of these. So left versus right, or just pick both of them up. My table saw is a left tilt saw. The blade goes to the left. This will help you set those angles perfectly accurate every single time. If you know that you need a 45 degree angle, this is gonna go over to 45 and lock in. It has two locks, you a little thumb screw here that's gonna secure it when you get it in position, and then this cam lock that's gonna make sure it does not move. You'll also see this little piece that pushes down. That's a kickstand. What that does is when you lay this flat, that keeps this on balance. Everything's now perfectly flat. Whereas if you don't have that on there, then it's just, it'll lay unflat. Why do you need that? Let me show you. The kickstand is useful when you're trying to set the angle on say a miter gauge or any other type tool. And you just need this to lay flat while you get that setting. Once everything's set, then I know that I can take this. I, I trust this. And now I can look and make sure everything lines up and it does so I know that this is accurate and I can continue making my work cuts. One of the unique features of this layout tool is you'll see that it has 45s so that it's showing you that it's gonna do 45 degree miters. And then also if you're doing any of these shapes, it tells you the exact degree you're gonna need for those that many cuts. So if we're doing five cuts and we're trying to get that shape there, we can do that. I don't know the name of the shape where I'd tell you. <laughs> if we're doing, uh, say, two, four, six cuts to get that shape, then that's the degree you're going to want and so on. Also, down here for a six to one or an eight to one dovetail joint, it's going to give you those degrees as well. On the bottom of the tool, you're going to notice that there's measurements in millimeters from zero out to 60 each way. Zero to 60 on the right and then again on the left. What that's for is to be able to quickly and easily find the center of a board. All we do is measure this one up. This is 53 on each side. And then once we're at 53, all we have to do is mark the zero and then that is center of the board. It's that fast, it's that easy. This also has a marking gauge built in. You see it right here. We can move this either in the millimeter on the right or imperial on the left in 30 seconds all the way up wherever you want. So if we wanted a one inch mark, we're gonna move that up to a one inch and then we'll be able to use that as a guide to mark our work. Once you get it set to that one inch, you're just gonna hold your pencil or your marking tool there. You just move the gauge while holding the line and you'll be able to make mark a perfectly one inch line. If you're trying to match dados or mortise and tenon, anything like that, and you need to know how deep something is, it also has a depth gauge right here. All you gotta do is drop it in the hole and then tighten that thumb screw. It's gonna tell you exactly to the 30 seconds how deep that is. It has a dovetail design so you can stick this in there and it's gonna ride in that track perfectly without any play. Now you have a height gauge. So you could just move this up until the lines 
match up to the height you're wanting. I've got it set to one inch and now all I have to do is use that as a depth gauge to set my saw blade height. You can also use the UG1 at the router table to set the height of those router bits and on the handheld router to set the depth of those bits as well. This is probably my favorite gauge to set the depth of bits because of the length of the depth gauge itself or the height gauge. It's so long that it goes all the way across almost any bit. You may notice that this has a uh, I don't know what you call that, an indention or a Z pattern to it on the blade. Let me show you what that's for. I think they thought of everything. That indention or that slot allows you to get beside the drill bit. So you can square up your table to the bit so you know you're getting those dialed in 90 degree cuts. A good example here is if, you, if I just throw this up against the bit, it almost looks square if you're not looking closely. But if you slide that in there, you can really see there's a gap right there that needs to be corrected, so I need to square this table up. You can also use this at the bandsaw to set the angle of your table so you get that awesome accurate cut on that angle. You can also use this as a regular square to check the square of your blades or the square of your fence. One thing to note about the UG1 is at 90 degrees fully collapsed, you would think that was 90 degrees if you go all the way and just tighten it up. It's actually about two degrees past 90. So you wanna make sure and line up that mark at the 90 degree mark so you don't get any off measurements. However, on this end, the solid end that doesn't move, that is a perfect 90. And that's what I would use to use as a 90 degree angle or a 90 degree reference. Full disclosure, Bridge City did send me this set of gauges and this video is sponsored in part by Bridge City Tours. These really are those tools you didn't know you needed until you got them. I find myself reaching for these all the time. You can use them to square up jointer fences. The blade's even thin enough that it goes between the teeth so you can actually square the blade up on the table saw. It's just a really, really good tool to have in the shop. Number two on the list are these Wood Owl Overdrive bits. They're specifically designed for cordless drills and they drill a clean hole without tear out. That's their claim, let's find out. I've set up a test. I'm gonna use a regular drill bit, a Forster bit, and then also the wood owl bit and see how much difference there is and how they perform drilling through three quarter inch plywood. Regular bit, three quarter inch plywood. Tore out coming through the back side. It also tore out on the front side, just a little. Now the Forstner bit. Whoa. It tore out pretty good on the back side. Now the wood owl bit. Whoa, wee! That is impressive. This is the back side. Forstner bit, regular bit even tore out a little. But the owl overdrive bit, the hole is as clean on the inside, a little cleaner and smoother actually, than the Forstner bit, just a super clean hole. Mike Taylor sent me these to give a try, and man, am I impressed. Maybe that was a fluke. Let's see what happens. I mean, just a smidgen. I mean, it is starting to show a, a tiny tear out, but nothing like what we saw earlier. No tear out on that one at all. I think the difference is how much pressure I'm putting. If I just let the bit do the work, we get these clean holes. I wanna try the big boy. This one, we can call this one Big Hoss. Woo, super clean. You can tell when it goes through whether it's gonna be a really clean hole or not just by the way it sounds and the way it pulls right through. And it pulls off these just really cool shavings. Impressed. I think one of the keys to a good clean hole with the overdrive bits is to set the drill on a lower speed also. Uh, so the number one setting on this one, this one has two speeds, low and high. And so the number one setting, I just tried to do that with a Forstner bit to see if that would also help, but it does not. It is just as bad, if not worse. Before we get to number three, I have a very huge favor to ask of you. Just hit the subscribe button. That's it. I set a goal last year to make it to 500,000 subscribers by the end of this year, which is 2022. If you haven't subscribed, I would, oh, please hit the subscribe button. It helps me a ton. I wanna reach my goal this year. I have 200,000 to go as of this point, so you could help me greatly. Number three on the list is a little tool I bought a few weeks ago, and I just keep reaching for it and reaching for it and reaching for it. It's the Woodpecker's Delve Square. I've looked at this square many, many times and debated whether do I need this, do I want this, would I use it? 
So it took me a while to actually decide to buy it. And when I did, I got it in the shop and I've just been super impressed with it. It's no secret that I'm a fan or a fanboy, as you may call me, of Woodpecker's tools. I just love their accuracy and their quality. This is made in the USA. It's all aluminum, anodized aluminum, and it, the markings are super easy to read. You'll notice that the blade is offset on that, and there's a reason for that. On three quarter inch stock, you can lay that up there with the wide side of the blade, make a mark, flip it over. You can make the mark or you can double check it. That's the center of the board on all three quarter inch stock. It's made for that. Short side of the blade, if you lay it against there and make your marks, You have a perfectly centered mortise and tenon layout for three quarter inch pieces. There's holes drilled all the way from one eighth of an inch all the way to three and a eighth every eighth. So if you wanted to lay out a mark for one inch, you just hold pressure that way, put your pencil in the hole and then drag. Another very cool feature of this little drill, there's a hole right there. What is that? If we're pretending that's a face frame, you got a self-centering drill bit, check that out. That hole is exactly in the center of a three quarter inch piece. Also, this bottom blade is exactly one quarter inch thick, so you can use that as a reference. These blades are a half inch wide and an eighth inch thick, so you can use those as references as well. I love this little square. If you hang it anywhere close or set it anywhere close to where you're gonna be working, you're gonna pick that thing up all the time. These are radius jigs you can use on the router table, and if you make cutting boards or charcuterie boards, these make quick work of those ends just to give it that nice finished look. What's great about these is there's a set of three, but you get six different radiuses because there's two on each side. You can see here, hook it in like that. And then if you flip it over, you get the other side. You can make it a sharper radius. The radiuses on these are 3 8 inch, 9 16 3 quarter, an inch and 3 16 one inch, and an inch and 3 8 So you get a wide variety from a sharp corner to a really long rounded corner. On this board as an example, I was showing you a tight radius versus a longer radius. Whatever side's facing down has two tabs on there that hooks into the board so it's secure against it and you can just ease it into that template bit. It'll follow right along. I got a little burning because I was going really slow and this is curly maple or quilted maple so it's more prone to burning than most woods. Last but certainly not least, any woodworker anywhere at some point you're going to need some type of flush trim saw. And this is the one I recommend. It's actually a dovetail saw. Let me show you. When doing different types of joinery, sometimes you will need to hide a screw hole and you're gonna to need to fill it. Like right here, we have a screw in this hole and I wanna cover that because I don't want that screw showing at the final piece. 3 8 inch hole, 3 8 inch dowel. Stick that in there. Take your flush trim saw. What I like about this one is it has a coarse and a fine. Now we can take a sander and sand that flush and it'll just have that screw covered. There's several different styles of these available. There's some less expensive ones like this Co-Melon. It's got an angled handle. This one's worked well. I've had it for several years. It cuts a little bit rougher than the others and it doesn't stay as sharp as long. What I like about these is they fold down out of the way so they take up less space as well as it protects that blade from getting damaged. I like to hang mine on the wall but they've been living in the drawer for years so they survive well in there as well. There's two different kinds like this. This is, has a blade on each side, the fine and the coarse, like I showed you before. And then there's one that just has a one-sided blade and it has fine teeth on it. Also, these blades are replaceable. You could just pick up a new blade when this one wears out. I don't only use these to flush cut dowels. I use these on almost every project when I have just a little bit of trim sticking over the edge of something or I just need to make a small cut. These are extremely handy to have and they make such a fine cut, there's very little finishing to do after you're through cutting. If you're looking for your first flush trim saw or you wanna upgrade what you have to a better model, I highly recommend these Sui Zan, S-U-I-Z-A-N. Uh, they're highly rated and I've had these for probably over a year and I've used them a ton. If you don't have a saw like this, pick one up and the first time you need it, you're gonna have it and you're gonna say, Thank you, Mad Outlaw. And I'm gonna hear you, and I'm gonna say you are. If you like this video, you'll love the Woodworking Tips and Tricks compilation right there. Lots of good information there you don't wanna miss. Click the box, get you the big old virtual fist bump.